Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall, your companion on these journeys we take to the outer boundaries of the unknown. Perhaps the greatest unknown of all is not what exists out there in the nether regions of distant space, but that which beats constantly inside each of us, the human heart. The human heart. It's both a tangible physical organ and also a mysterious, incomprehensible force. Yes, it's the brain that weighs, assays, analyzes. But in the end, it is the heart that decides. And each of us may be surprised by the decision of his heart. Because the heart has its own reasons. What is it, darling? Wild animals, Edna. Wild animals and poisonous snakes in particular make me nervous. Darling, he's safely behind that glass cage. Isn't he beautiful? Such elegance. He is a symphony in beauty. And death. I dare say. Would you like to pet him? Would I like to pet him? Why on earth would I like to pet a 15-foot poisonous snake? Because he's a charmer. And I can tell by the way he looks at you that he likes you. What are you doing? You... You're opening that glass cage. I'm letting him out. Why? Because he wants to play with you. No. No. Let me out of here. Let me out. Our mystery drama, I Must Kill Edna, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Elliot Reed. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We are commanded by laws both human and divine, to tell the truth. But what is truth? If sages, philosophers, and saints have disagreed, what hope is there for us ordinary, modest folk? 
The ancient Romans actually exempted certain areas of human behavior from the truth. For instance, you didn't have to tell the truth about love. And a famous saying of the times was, the gods laugh at the lies of lovers. And uh, talking about love, we now arrive at that delicate balance of falsehood and truth from which is drawn all of love's nourishment and sustenance. And to a consideration of Chester Macefield, a lover par excellence. When Chester said to Edna Morrissey, I love you, darling, he was telling the truth as he saw it and felt it and wished it on that particular day. But let the story tell itself. You must listen to me, Edna. Darling. Yes, darling, my darling, my darling, Edna. Chester. No, don't tell me to stop. Be sensible. Why? Why should I be sensible? Because. Why should I be sensible? Why be prejudiced against me? Who else in this mad world is sensible? Chester, please be serious. My darling, Edna. Oh, you live in a universe filled with fools and madmen. Oh, Chester. No, you must permit me my say. But a marriage between you and me, it, it, it's impossible. Why? We've been through it. Why? I'm older. This match was arranged in heaven. I need an older woman. You need a younger man. I don't need a man who will... How do you know? You never had one. I had to say that, Edna. Why? It isn't true. I've been married. To whom? To a dried up, decrepit, doddering old... Chester, he... He was a soul of goodness. The spirit of generosity. He... I'll give him all that. But he wasn't much good for a woman. Certain things are, are more important than the fleeting physical Darling attraction. Edna, you can say what you like. And you can like what you say, but it's a life. We human beings were made for one thing and one thing only. And that's love. Oh. Everything else... Merely fills the rest of the time. Oh, Chester, can't you ever be serious? I'm always serious. I'm tending to the serious business of life, which is love. You're the frivolous one, frittering away your time with all sorts of ridiculous projects. Oh. I believe you call them good works. Surely even you must be aware that there are people who are starving. Ah, but I'm wise to you, darling. I know why you engage in these frenetic philanthropies. Do you? You're only trying to whitewash your father. My father was kind and good. To you. To you alone in all the world. But he sweated and swindled and stole his fortune from the poor, from the helpless, Chester, from the ignorant. That's a vicious... Yeah, careful, careful, don't say lie. Uh, but that was a long time ago. And nobody cares. No one remembers. You don't have to give it back. Oh, Chester, what am I going to do with you? Marry me. But it simply doesn't make sense. Darling, please stop objecting so much. Come here. Oh, Chester. You see, my darling, nothing, but nothing could ever be more important than this. Do you agree? I... I'm not sure. Let's try it again. <laughs> Edna, of course, was deliriously happy, and I, well, I was happy too. It was an exciting, a heady experience for each of us. For Edna, it was an introduction to love. For me, it was an introduction to wealth. There are, after all, very few men in our society whose wives are millionaires. And I had joined this extremely select group. And I tell you... There's nothing like it. However, there was the matter of some of her charities. But if we could have everything we want here on Earth, there'd be no point in going to heaven after we die, would there? And this, my darling, is our newest building here on Animal Farm. I see. It's a serpentarium. A, a what? A serpentarium. A house of snakes. How, how fascinating. Yes. Poor, maligned, and misunderstood creatures. Come, would you like to see them? Well, I... Oh, they're, they're all secure behind glass. 
In that case... Uh... These... These are called pit vipers. Oh. That's because they have that indentation between the eye and the nose. Fascinating. These are all rattlesnakes and copperheads. Charming creatures. They are lovely, graceful, elegant. And yet mankind will soon exterminate them completely. Now, darling, is that bad? Oh, my dear, you're such a barbarian. I love them. They're beautiful, cool, and pleasant to the touch. My dear, you don't touch them. I've been told that they won't harm you if... Yes? If there is neither hate nor fear in your heart. Mm. Is it all right if uh, I never touch them? Oh, Chester, darling. I know you're laughing at me. I'm doing no such thing. I believe everything you're telling me. You lie so beautifully. You think I'm a nut. And all these activities of mine... Oh, I, I approve of them completely. They bore you stiff. No. As a matter of fact... I didn't marry you in the hope of changing you. <laughs> Why don't you drive to town today? Have lunch at your club. Do something you like. And you'll come back refreshed. Are you sure you can spare me? No. But I'll get through the day. Somehow. Chester! Chester Macefield. Why, it's Fred. I thought you'd given up the club for good. I've been in the country these past few months. Uh, join me for lunch? Of course. I understand congratulations are in order. Thank you. Here, she's a lovely woman. Thank you again. And uh, money doesn't hurt either. That is a low blow. There are no low blows among old friends, only bitter truths. She's 50. And in what we could consider the soft September of her beauty. I'm 40, and I've decided to retire. From what? From love. From love? Precisely. Well, how does one retire Ever from since love? I found out that we were boys and they were girls, love has been my occupation. <laughs> my preoccupation. My profession. Other men would say, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, a banker, but I would say, I'm a lover. Well, I suppose you were at that. Now I realize that love simply does not exist. It's a snare, a delusion, a swindle. This from you, Chester, the lover? The oasis of love is merely a mirage. I will no longer pursue it. But it was always a lie, a lovely lie. Well, since love doesn't exist... I've decided to settle for happiness. You sound as if the two are mutually exclusive. Perhaps they are. Mr. Caswell? Oh, my goodness. I had forgotten all about you. <laughs> the doorman said you'd be in the dining room, and I said... Well, well, I don't know if I should really interrupt Mr. Caswell when he's discussing important business. Have you had your lunch? Well, I... An aspiring young actress should never turn down a meal. Even if you had lunch, eat again. You may be out of luck tomorrow. <laughs> oh, really, Mr. Caswell? You're so kind. Yes, I know. Chester, this is Sue Ellen Quackenbush. Mr. Macefield, Sue Ellen. Hello, Sue Ellen. Are you a theatrical producer, too, Mr. Mason? No, he can't do you any good at all. Turn it off, Sue Ellen. Oh, isn't he terrible, Mr. Mason? Her father saved my life before she was born a couple of wars ago. Now, this one wants to be an actress, so he sends her to see me. Uh, for old time's sake, can I do something? Well, he did save your life. Still, it's too much to ask in return. But you are a famous producer, Fred. Oh, what am I going to do with you, Sue Ellen? She's a lovely child, but she can't act for beans. I'm not a child. I'm 23. Let's order lunch. Now, what would you like, Sue Ellen? Well, um, what, what is this? Beef burry geek non. <laughs> did I pronounce that right? Mm. I took a year of French in high school. She looked up from the menu as she spoke, and her eyes met mine, and the very words I had spoken but a few moments before exploded in my brain. That sudden stabbing shock of recognition when the heart is fatally but oh so sweetly wounded by a woman's glance. Is this how it happens? 
Have I been stabbed finally and at length and for the first time in my life by... by a provincial schoolgirl? Struggling with French words on a menu? And, uh... Uh, le soup onion, avec croutons, and fromage, and um, uh, the uh, calf au lait. <laughs> well, I must say, this is an elegant apartment. I mean, it's like the movies. Is it yours? Oh, yes. That car and this place. Oh, you must be a very wealthy person, Mr. Macefield. Chester. Chester? Uh, we have some folks in Talbot Corners who are well off, you know, but no one who's actually wealthy. May I fix you a drink? Oh, you don't have to fix my drink. Just open a bottle of pop. Well, here we are. Yes, here we are. And isn't it just like a book? A simple girl from the country in this luxurious millionaire's apartment. It's like a movie I saw at the Ritz, where they had this... Sue Ellen. Yes? Please, shut up. Mr. Mayfield. I have something to tell you. I love you. Mr. Mayfield. Chester. Chester? I fell in love with you. The only way people can really fall in love. At first sight. Sue Ellen, please, now say something. I, I, I don't know what to say. Look at me. They'd never believe it back home. Sue Ellen had a loss for words. But this is, well, it's... it's I know. It's crazy. I'm twice your age. But it's, it's just... Don't say it's impossible. Well, no, it's, it's just... It's what? Well, I just don't know what it is. Because, well, you see, I also fell in love with you. Hello, darling. Am I late for dinner? No, dear. As master of this house, dinner must wait your pleasure. Oh, oh I'm starved. Say, uh, did I see Hallowell's car on the road? Yes, I'm sure you did. What was he doing here? I wanted to sign over some property to you. Oh, no, darling. Oh, not very much, just some income. So that you don't have to ask me for money. I think it must be embarrassing for a man. Oh, darling, I, I don't think it's right for you to... Nonsense. Tell me, did anything interesting happen to you in town? No... It was a rather dull, boring, prosaic day. After all, I wasn't with you. True, this may sound like the worst kind of male chauvinism, but could a man ask for a better deal? A young girl for excitement and romance? A mature woman for stability and financial independence? Sounds great. Looks good. But the problem with a structure of this kind is that the foundations rest on quicksand. Something will have to give when I return shortly with Act Two. For some people, life is a quest, a pursuit of a goal. There are those dedicated souls who search for the great truths of science, of medicine. Noble spirits who strive to make the world better for their having been here. For years, Chester Macefield has also been a seeker. But his aim has been far more modest. He has been looking for love. For someone he could adore with his heart and soul. Well, aren't we all? And Chester finally found her. And as you can imagine, Chester is deliriously happy. However, there are lucid moments when Chester is reminded of the fact that he is a married man. But you could get tickets, Chester, honey. Sue Ellen, that isn't the point. Oh, it's such a good show and all, and the acting is well, it's just marvelous. 
And if I don't get to see good acting, how am I ever going to learn how to be an actor? Sue Ellen, I... I can't take you to the theater. Well, for heaven's sakes, why not? I... I just couldn't afford to take the risk. I know what. Take me to Lericchio's for supper. Oh, uh, I, I'll do better than that. I'll have Lericchio's send supper here. What? A specially catered supper. Oh, but that isn't the same thing. You don't go to Lericchio's just to eat. You go there to be seen and talked about and photographed by, oh, by the media. And that's exactly why I can't take you. But I have to be seen. I want to get my name in the papers. I need publicity. That's how I can get an acting job. Darling, I... Well, I mean, you know, it, it, it just gets to be a drag sitting around here all the time. I love you, Sue Ellen. Please believe I love you. Well, I'd maybe believe it if... If what? If you divorced her, married me. I want to do that, Sue Ellen. You don't know how much I want to do that. Well, what, what's stopping you? If I left Edna, I... I wouldn't have a nickel. Oh. Oh, it's her money. Yes. Well, what are you going to do, Chester, honey? I don't know. I, but, but I know this. I simply can't do without you. I know, Chester, honey. I know. You'll think of something. Morning, Mr. Maysfield. Oh, good morning, Arnold. Have you seen Mrs. Maysfield? Uh, yes, sir. She's over at, um, uh, sir, 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 uh, sir, uh, you know, uh, over at Snake House. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Sure goes to them snakes. I mean, I've been working for that woman. Uh, it must be 20 years now. i never seen nothing like this. What do you mean, Arnold? Well, I guess she found what she's been aching to support all her life. True underdog. Genuine loser. Somebody nobody loves. <laughs> That's a snake hands down. Well, as you know, my, my wife is a most tender-hearted woman. Oh, uh, she's a saint. I bless her. But I... Uh, What's that? Well, I think you should talk to her. About what? Well, how could I put this? Uh, there's a big rattler. Uh, I mean, uh, well, they do come large, some of them. But he's just overgrown. Well, what about him? They ain't getting bit by a rattler, no picnic, but uh, it don't necessarily have to be fatal. Uh, you follow this? I can't say that I do. Well, on the other hand, this ugly critter's got fangs at least twice the normal length. You know, one chew out of them and... Uh, but, but what does well, this have to do with... She's taking a fancy to this varmint. She says to me, um, Oh, Arnold, he's so beautiful. If only I could pet him. So, well, maybe you better talk to her. Maybe I'd better. Well, after all, she's the only woman. Edna, darling. Chester. Oh, I didn't hear you come in. What are you doing here? Arnold tells me you spend almost all your time in this place. I simply can't take my eyes away from Nijinsky. Nijinsky? I've named him Nijinsky after that famous, I should say, immortal dancer. I know. The one who went mad? Yes. It's my name for him because his movements are like a ballet. Would you agree? Oh, uh, yes. I've made Nijinsky the star of the Serpentarium. He has this huge cage all to himself. I notice you're dressed for town. Are you going to the city today? Yes, dear. Oh, that'll be the third time this week. Well, I... Oh, no, I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. It sounded as if I were counting. Oh, some people at the club want my advice on a venture. I have no right to tell you to stay at my side all day. You should have a rich, productive life of your own. Oh, darling, I owe these men a favor. No, you just go ahead. Is it a promising venture? Oh, uh, w well, it could be. If you need any money, let me know. Oh, darling, you shouldn't be so good to me. Why not? I love you. Come in, Angel. It's open. Darling. Oh. 
Oh, it's you. Chester. Well, of course, Chester. Oh, that's a stunning outfit. You didn't have to get all dressed up for me. Well, I... I, I couldn't very well call you at your home now. Could I? I, I mean, what could I have said? Well, why would you call me? Well, uh, to tell you that I, I couldn't see you tonight. What do you mean you couldn't see me? Hey, baby, it's the man himself. Oh. Uh, Perry Wilson, uh, I, w- I would like you to meet Mr. Chester Mayfield. Oh, how do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, Perry Wilson is the son of Angus Wilson, uh, who's my, my dad's dearest, closest friend back home in Talbot Corners. Well, uh, Perry and his mother and dad are here in town, and uh, they want me to have dinner with them at the hotel. <laughs> sort of like old times at home. Isn't that right, Perry? <laughs> oh, yeah, dinner, and... Uh... Well, uh, afterwards, we're going to play bridge. Uh, that's right. But you can't be my partner, Perry. You always get so mad when I forget which is Trump. <laughs> it's really only a game, and you make such an issue about it. Well, I, I don't know where you get that flightiness from, Sue Ellen. You, you know, your folks are such serious people. Uh, well, uh, shall we be going? Uh, Mother and Dad, do you... Well, they like to be prompt. Yes, I know. Well, I... Uh... Uh, Perry... Would you call your mother and dad and and say we're we're on the way? Uh, oh yeah, sure, sure, of course. It's good thinking. So, Ellen. I couldn't help this, Chester, honey. I must see you tonight. I'll wait for you here. Oh, but honey, I don't know. Please, what... darling. Oh, sweetie, it's it's going to be late, and I'm going to be tired and upset because the Wilsons always give me a pain, especially Perry. We're so conceited. But, darling, I... We can be together tomorrow night. Tomorrow? Why, that's only just a few hours away. So, Ellen, I love you. And I love you, too, Chester. Well, 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 if it isn't Dante, how's Beatrice? Cut it out. Mind if I sit here? You're a member of the club. What are you doing dining alone? What's that smirk on your face? Oh, I don't know. These May and December romances always inspire smirks, leers, winks. What are you talking about? Miss Sue Ellen Quackenbush. I understand you see quite a bit of her. I, I, I'm interested in her career. Mm, a fatherly interest, no doubt. She's a talented young lady. Yes, and her talent seems to be in getting men interested in furthering her career. Chester, you're talking to me. See here, Fred, I resent... Now the... drop it. I thought we were friends. But if you want to fill the time with trivia, let's talk about the weather. Fred, Chester, I remember what it's like to be 40. The age of anxiety. And it passes. I don't know what I'm going to do about her. Mm, she's a tough little cookie. Now see here. Okay, let's talk trivia. Chester... People are beginning to talk. I'm not interested in other people's hypocritical notions of morality. I don't care if they disapprove. Oh, they won't disapprove. What they will do is worse. They'll laugh. You're starting to become a ludicrous figure. I know. I know. Now, you can't afford that, not you, Chester. Thanks, Brent. Thanks. (laughs) That's what friends are for, no? Darling? Chester, I thought you were staying in town. Oh, a change in plan. Oh, what happened? Let me turn off the television. No, no, leave it on. Hmm. Oh, I just became bored with the city and decided to come home. Tell me about your day. Oh, you'd only laugh at me. Tell me about yours. Oh, you'd only laugh at me. (laughs) Well, I spent the day being hypnotized. Oh, by whom? By Nijinsky. I can just watch him for hours. I see. Have you been here before? Uh, uh, what are you watching now? Oh, I don't know. The television was on just while I was reading. I, I think it's one of those celebrity programs. Oh, it, it's at Larikio's restaurant. Have you ever been there? Uh, it's an old Good stamping ground of mine. Oh. Everybody, welcome to Larikio's, where you meet the stars of yesterday, today, Shall and even you? tomorrow, oh, if you like. And let's see who's here tonight. Oh. <laughs> Who is this breathtaking little blonde beauty? Wait. Isn't she In New York, pursuing a career in the theater, 
from Talbot Corners, Iowa, Miss Sue Ellen Quackenbush. Uh, <laughs> hi. Oh, I'm so thrilled, and I feel so humble to be right here in the middle of all these talented people. Chester. Uh, have you made Chester, many friends here in New York? Well, yes, I, I've made so Chester, many friends. you're so pale. Now. What is it? Are you and uh, Perry Wilson an item? Chester, you're ill. Perry and I an item? Well, let me turn this stupid thing off. Now, tell me what's bothering you. Nothing. Nothing. No, dear, I'm afraid something's very much the matter. Just sit down. I'll get you some water. I'll kill her. I'll kill her. They say there's no fool like an old fool. But still, Chester Macefield isn't that old. So how could he be that foolish? The answer probably lies in the fact that a fool in love is ageless, and therefore hopeless. Well, perhaps Chester will be less foolish when I return shortly with Act Three. Mr. Macefield is speeding into the city with blood in his eye and a 32 caliber pistol in his pocket. Chester Macefield, a man of the world, has been betrayed by a woman. A slip of a girl, barely out of her teens. But she has wounded him. Not just in his heart, which after all can recover, but in his vanity, which can never be the same. Chester! You lied to me, Sue Ellen. You lied to me. Now, Chester, honey, I don't have the vaguest notion what you're talking about. I'm so thrilled, and I feel so humble to be in the midst of all these talented people. Oh, that. Yes, that. Well, honey, just what do you think you can do about it? I can kill you. Chester, put that gun away. Back home, everybody has a gun, and we have all kinds of accidents. I'm going to kill you, Sue Ellen. Why? Why? Because you lied to me. And who says I can't lie to you? What am I supposed to do while you're at home making love to your wife? How am I supposed to feel? What am I supposed to think? You want everything your way. Sue Ellen, I love you. Oh, fine. I love you, too. But maybe love isn't enough. What do you want? You take that tone out of your voice. Don't you make it sound as if I want something unreasonable. I want what I have a right to want. A man I can be seen with. A man I can be with all the time. I don't want a man who's ashamed of me. But I'm not ashamed. Then take me places. But you know I have a wife. Then choose between us. Sue Ellen. It's your problem. Wait for me. Why? What is going to happen? I don't know. I... I'll think of something. Please. Well, all right. All right. But I don't want to wait forever. had the gun in my pocket. I'd rushed out of my house filled with an insane rage to kill. But the moment I saw her, heard her voice, touched her hand, I knew I couldn't. I knew I couldn't kill her. And yet, if I wanted Sue Ellen, I would have to kill Edna. Because, and it sounds so mercenary and mundane, but without Edna's money, I knew that I could never have Sue Ellen. But kill. How do you kill? Murder. Ending the life of another human being. Forever. I couldn't murder Edna. I couldn't. I wouldn't. And yet, as long as Edna lived, I would be forced to do without Sue Ellen. And for me... That would be worse than death. Edna? Ah, good morning, darling. I suppose it's true. What's true? What Arnold tells me, that you spend so much of your time here in the Serpentarium. Oh, I'm just fascinated by Nijinsky. I think we're beginning to communicate. You are? I think what he's trying to tell me is, please don't be afraid I mean you no harm. Let us be friends. He says that? 
Well, no, he doesn't say that in so many words. It's the thought that he's trying to communicate. I see. And he is succeeding. Is he? How can you tell? Because each day I become less and less afraid. Oh? And one day, I know, I just know. I'll walk in here and Dushinsky and I will look at each other and smile. And all the fear will be gone from my heart. And I'll be able to say to Nijinsky, Come, old friend, why don't we go walking together? You mean you'll actually let him out of his cage? His prison. Why not? He is being shut up there because of the evil that's in my heart, not in his. Well... It'll be the greatest challenge of my life. The test of how I really feel. And I hope to be ready for it. Do you? When? Why do you ask? Well, so that I will be able to lock you up in your room until the foolishness passes. <laughs> I don't really know when. It could happen to me tomorrow. Or next week or next month. Next year. Or never. Oh, I shouldn't have said a word to you about it. Darling, I... I'm your husband. And I love you. And I love you. But... Two people can never completely become one. There's always a tiny secret place in the heart that... Well, that's my tiny secret place. Hello? Sue Ellen, darling. Oh, it's you. Is that the chump? to say to me. Hang up on him. He pays the rent, remember? I, I just wanted to tell you, things will be looking up very soon. That's what you said last night. I, I know. And the night before? Mary, you stop that now. You and I will be married very soon, darling. Have you asked her for a divorce? No, but... But what? Mary. I've got something better planned. What could be better? Now, just be patient. How long am I supposed to be patient? Just a little while longer. And what do I do in the meanwhile? Sit around, all alone, every night? <laughs> Perry, Perry, you're terrible. Sue Ellen, I love you. I need you. Soon, I'll be able to give you everything your heart has ever desired. Tell me you love me. Honey, you know I love you. I have to know that. I have to be sure of that. And now I... I see what I have to do. Goodbye, darling. I'll be with you soon. Very soon. And I'll be free. Chester? Ke he hung up. Well, let's see, baby. Where were we? Darling, uh, would you mind terribly if I went into the city this evening? Of course not, dear. It's these same people at the club. You know, the ones I told you about. Oh, yes. For some reason, I can't imagine why, they seem to think I have a knowledge of land values. Well, Chester, you are a very capable person. Oh. Well, this thing may run late, so don't wait up for me. I will. I always feel, well, incomplete unless you're in the house with me. always remember how she looked. She was almost pretty when she had that shy smile on her face. But would it be murder? If all I did was help her to kill herself? She had this insane affinity for a lethally poisonous snake. Sooner or later she would release him from his cage in the mad delusion that he was her dear friend. Would it be murder? No. Murder? Look at him. This enormous monster coiled in his cage, sleeping. No one had seen me enter this house of crawling, murderous creatures. Here on the side is the latch. All I need do is turn it to open and just slide the glass a few inches to the side and 
when he wakes up. Oh, no. Don't wake up just yet. Give me my chance to get out of here. That's it. Sleep soundly. And when morning comes, you'll notice the opening and you'll slither out. And when she walks in here, you'll greet her the way a poisonous snake usually greets people. Good night, Nijinsky. And good hunting. Honey? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I better leave? Why, Shook? Well, maybe, well, you know, the chump. Oh, the chump never shows up unless he calls first. And you know something? Hmm? I'm getting sick and tired of Mr. Chester Macefield. Uh, uh, well, well, darling, let's not be hasty. You know, you don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Yes, well. <laughs> this horse is kind of old and lame. <laughs> hey, what's that? Does he have a key? Oh, my goodness. It's Chester. Sue Ellen, I have wonderful news. Sue Ellen, what is... Uh, not... Chester, darling, let me explain. Explain? What? Uh, look, why, uh, uh, why don't I just uh, get out of here and leave you two to... Stay where you are. I don't see how you can stop me. I yet. said stay uh, where uh, you are. Well, now, listen, please. Please be careful. With stay you. where you are and shut now, up. Chester, Angel, you don't need that gun. I can explain. Shut up. What? Why did you come here with a gun? Why? What made me bring the gun? I must have known. Deep down, inside, that I would have to use it. Please, please, Chester, don't talk that way. I'm going to kill you. No, no, please. And him also. Oh, now, look, Mister, please, what did we ever do to you? And what did you do to me? Oh, all we were doing was having fun. Would you, would you, gonna, you gonna kill us for that? Chester, you're an old man. You just weren't enough. Stop! Oh, don't kill us. Look, Mister, I don't want to die. Oh. You'll never laugh at me again. Never. Edna, I have to save Edna. Maybe, maybe he's still asleep. Maybe he's still in his cage. I'll just slide the glass closed again and lock the... He's out. I'll have to kill him. No, no. Empty. Keep away from me. Keep away. I can't move. Why can't I move? Keep away. No! Ah! Uh, I'm sorry, Miss, Miss Macefield. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, I don't understand. What are you doing inside here? Latch the cage was open. Uh, yes. Why did he let Nijinsky out? It's my fault. Your fault? Well, why'd you say that? I... I must have given him the idea. Maybe he wanted to show me that he would do it first. Uh-huh. He was becoming interested in animals. Toward the end, he had become a much more gentle person. But... But Nijinsky shouldn't have been able to kill him. How could he miss with those lethal fangs? Miss Maysfield, I got to make a confession. Uh, when I heard you talk one day, you know, pet Nijinsky, you scared me so much that, well, I had the vet sneak in here and remove his poison sacks. Well, then, why did Mr. Maysfield die? Well, I guess that's something we'll never know. But we know Chester Macefield died because, in so many cases, fear, fear itself is more than enough, especially when it's aided by a guilty conscience. As William F. Cody, better known as Buffalo Bill, used to say, if a man is scared enough of a gun, you can kill him with a blank cartridge. many lessons that we may learn from our little morality play, and one of them teaches us that a man who falls in love with a girl who is half his age 
can only please her half as much, even if he tries twice as hard. However, we realize the futility of trying to give advice in these matters of the heart. The only meaningful advice we can give you is to tune in again. Our cast included Elliot Reed, Joan Loring, Leon Janney, E.V. Jester, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I began to hear a strange sound, like the flapping of a thousand wings coming nearer and nearer. Tony, look! The sky is black with them! Birds. Huge birds. Martha, what are they? They're all pink and red. I think they're flamingos. I've never seen so many birds in my life. They're coming closer and closer. Oh, Tony, they're frightened. What should we do? I don't know. Martha, use your cane. That big one... Oh, that big one just knocked off my glasses. I can't see. Don't think I can fight them. There's too many of Keep them. Keep at it, darling. Sooner or later. Oh. Oh. Martha? What happened? Where did they go? They? The flamingos. The birds. They, they disappeared as suddenly as they came. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. What lengths will someone go in order to survive? Does the survival instinct override their conscience and allow them to commit not only murder but also the taboo act of cannibalism? What happens when a person crosses the line from dark fantasy to real-life acts of brutal rape, murder, and cannibalism? Are these people driven by a desire so insatiable that they're incapable of controlling it? Murderous Minds Volume 3 – Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escape the Headlines is the latest offering in a series that takes you inside the lives of killers who committed cold-blooded murder for a glimpse at events that drove them to kill. Authored within a historical context, each chapter is an unbelievable venture inside the dark and twisted world of real cannibal killers whose names and crimes might not be familiar to you. By weaving a tale in which dark fantasies become reality, this audiobook invites you to see life from a perspective few ever witness, from that of the killer. Along with a historical look at cannibalism through the ages, these stories beg the listener to answer the question, was the murderer committing cannibalism because he was incapable of resisting the urge to kill and consume? Or is the explanation simply pure evil? Murderous Minds, Volume 3 Written by Ryan Becker and Curtis Giles Vasey Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com Price of Fear 
Brought to you by Vincent Price. Hello there. Are you a Who Done It fan? I mean the good old-fashioned kind, with a closed circle of cut-and-dried suspects exuding cut-and-dried clues until the last chapter when all is revealed and you kick yourself for not having been able to work it all out without the author's help? <laughs> Who done it? are out of fashion now, I'm told, perhaps because truth is never as cozy or as well-ordered as fiction. I was once in a position where I found I had been in possession of certain facts, the significance of which had for years eluded me. This was just as well, because I was spared the final and horrifying knowledge, which was itself a killer. For at first, you see, I wasn't even aware that there had been a crime. Let me explain. Oh, by the way, I, I think I'll call this story Guy Fawkes Night. It was all brought back to me last November when I was in London by one of those impossible coincidences that sometimes happen. Papers? Evening papers? Get your papers here. Penny for the guy, mister. I had strolled out in the early evening to get some air and to buy a paper. Please, Gub, spare a penny for the old guy. When I was accosted by this little fellow, one of a band of sturdy urchins who proliferate in the London streets in the weeks immediately preceding November 5th, only the English would make an annual festival out of an attempted massacre of their temporal rulers. Perhaps it comes from a misplaced assumption of invincibility. But for me, its horrific associations are rather more immediate. I gave the boy a small donation. Oh, thanks, mister. And bought a paper. Three pence. Thank you, sir. I glanced at it casually, meaning to read it at my leisure later. But my eye was caught by a headline. Sir David Thomas found dead. Sir David Thomas, 37, a distinguished psychiatrist and specialist in nervous diseases, was found dead in his Harley Street consulting rooms early today. He had suffered from earlier heart tremors, and, and the rest of the article consisted of an obit on his fine list of achievements in the field of psychiatric research. I remembered the last time but one that I had seen David Thomas. It was in uh, 1960. There's a Mr. David Thomas to see, sir. David? Uh, I don't know anyone called David Thomas. Ask him what he wants. Just a moment, sir. I was tired and irritable. My plane to London had been delayed by fog, and I was due on the set at some godforsaken hour the next morning. I just wanted to get to bed. Are you still there, sir? Yes. He says you knew his mother, sir. The lady's name was Helen. Helen? Helen Thomas. Oh, yes, yes. Well, uh, you'd better send him up. Right away, sir. Surprisingly, I recognized my visitor the moment he walked in. I say surprisingly because the last time I had seen David, it was at his home, Rykart. <laughs> He'd been all of fourteen. It was good of you to see me, sir. I'm sorry to barge in like this. Damn cheap without writing and all that. But I don't know who else to turn to. Well, sit down, David. <laughs> Has been a long time. Another world, sir. Rykart Manor. Rykart Manor, yes. How's your mother? It's because of her that I'm here. She's not well, sir. Oh, I am sorry, David, very sorry. You see, she once told me that you and she had been, well, close. Well, that was a long time ago, David. As you say, another world. What's wrong? She hasn't been really well since the night of that Guy Fawkes party at Rycott. Do you remember it? Yes, of course. She had some shock. We never discovered what it was. She wouldn't or couldn't talk about it. Most of the time, she's quite rational, but she has violent periods. She has to be protected. You understand me, sir? She lives quietly at Panton Sanatorium. But can't she be cured? The doctors and nurses are very kind, but it seems her mind has gone. Oh, no. Oh. At first, I couldn't accept it either. Mother had been such a gentle person. I resented a god who could let such things happen. Even her doctors didn't seem able to help her. So I made up my mind to become a doctor 
and try to beat them at their own game. I take my finals next year, then I hope to specialize. Well, of course, I wish you all the luck in the world, David. That goes without saying, but I, I really don't see how I can help. Oh, but you can help, sir. You see, Mother won't see me. Oh? She won't even have me in the same room with her. And she won't tell anyone why. Well, I... I... You could see her. You were there that night. Find out what's behind it all. Why she hates me so. Then we can begin to treat her. Well... Oh, please don't say no. She's talked about you to the nurses. I don't think they really believe she knows such a famous man. Please do this for me, sir. I know she'd love to see you. Would Helen really be so pleased to see me after all these years? We'd been art students together at London University way back in 35. She was an attractive, vital girl, and naturally competition to take her out had been keen. Can I have a drink, Vincent? Certainly. I want to talk to you. Well, talk away. Listen, Vincent. I'm going to get married. You did say married? Mm-hmm. I've thought about it, and it seems a good solution. A <laughs> solution to what? You're not serious. Vincent. Well, may I ask the name of the lucky man? Frank Thomas. Frank Thomas? Oh, well, now I know you're kidding. No, I'm not kidding, Vincent. He asked me last night. Well... No, but... before you say anything else, listen to me. I've got no illusions about my talent. So you're selling out, huh? Cynically, but accurately put. I've lost interest, I'm afraid. Helen... Do you know what sort of a reputation this Frank Thomas has? A lot of nonsense put about by his enemies. Nothing's ever been proved against him, just because he's rich and has got a lovely house in the country. Yes, I've heard about Rycott Manor. <laughs> Helen, you're not marrying a house, you know. Oh, Vincent. After that, my feelings towards Helen took a decidedly chilly turn. And though she asked me, I didn't go to the wedding. Instead, I returned to America and got on with my professional career, which, as it turned out, put her effectively out of my mind. I do appreciate you coming to see Mother, Mr. Price. That's all right, David. It's a pleasure. Oh, I think we've not far to go now. Over the crest of the next hill. It's pretty country, isn't it? Yes, yes, but then I always find the English countryside captivating. The house lies in its own grounds, just like Rycott. Do you remember the old home? My only visit to the Thomases' home was some 15 years or so after that last night out with Helen. I was back in England to discuss a new movie when one day, totally out of the blue, I received a letter asking me to attend a Guy Fawkes firework party at Rycott Manor. At first I couldn't think who I could possibly know at such an exalted address. Then I realized that it must be Helen. Although we had not parted on the best of terms, my curiosity got the better of me. I badly wanted to know how things had worked out for her, so I decided to accept the invitation. I couldn't get away from town until late, which meant I arrived at the house after the other guests had finished supper. It was one of those deliciously crisp evenings peculiar to fall in England, so I paid off the taxi at the bottom of the drive and approached Rycott Manor across the lawns. The best way to see it. Fairy lamps had been strung along the trees in front of the terrace, and I could see the great bonfire waiting to be lit. Above it, as if surveying the scene, was the guy. It was tied to what appeared to be a plank, its head fastened back so that the straw wouldn't fall out. Silhouetted against the lamps, twinkling in the trees and the lights from the house, it looked uncannily lifelike. I even fancied that its eyes caught the light, reflecting it like those of a, of a cat. It was obviously constructed with the loving care of an artist. Helen met me at the door. Vincent! Vincent, how good to see you. Here, let me take your coat. I want to talk to you alone before we join the others. Uh, Frank is resting in his study, so I'll take you into the morning room. How like Helen I thought to have a morning room. Well, the world-famous film actor. <laughs> oh, I'm so pleased for you, Vincent. Helen, let me look at you. Hmm? Now, how have you been? I read in the papers that you were here, so I thought for old time's sake... Helen. Yes? How have you been? 
Do you want a truthful answer or merely a polite one? Is it so bad? If you say I told you so, I'll send you packing at once. But I told you nothing you didn't already know. That makes it worse. Well, go on, tell me. I have everything material that I want. I go short of nothing. But there is no love in this house, Vincent, and it frightens me. Frank is too busy. If he's not running his offices in the city, he's running the estate down here. And he does that just as efficiently and just as ruthlessly. Well, why have you stuck it out all these years? Because I have a son, Vincent. You'll be meeting him presently. His name is David, and he's fourteen. He's all I live for now, Vincent. David. And um, how does David get on with his father? Truly, I don't know. David is hard to know, like his father. Sometimes I think he hates him. Oh, my poor Helen. Please don't pity me, Vincent. I've been holding on to my self-control for years, and it wouldn't take much to let go. David is a sensitive, intelligent boy, but their interests are totally different. Uh, David takes after you. I fancy he has artistic leanings. Yes, possibly. But why do you say that? Well, my dear, I, I'm deducing that he built that guy I saw as I came oh. here. Hmm? It's a remarkable piece of work, you know. <laughs> There's some, well, some haunting quality about it. Thank you. He'll be pleased. He worked hard making it. If your son becomes an artist, you won't have wasted your own talent, you know. Thank you, Vincent. <laughs> that was a very nice thing to say. I want to send David away, away to boarding school. I think it's important to get him away from his father's environment. Oh? You see, lately their relationship has deteriorated. Well, what caused that? Anything specific? Well, there was a rather unfortunate incident about two weeks ago. Two poachers were caught on the estate, a crime Frank won't tolerate. They were trapped in a copse, and Frank gave orders to smoke them out. David was there when they were brought out. You see, the men had stuck it out to the last possible moment, and they were so blackened and scorched that their features were unrecognizable. Most of their clothes had gone, and they just lay on the ground and writhed in agony. Two died in hospital. It's touch and go whether the third will recover. But Helen, my dear, that, that's inhuman. Didn't anyone make a complaint? It was hushed up. After all, it wasn't Frank who was breaking the law. He was just protecting his property. Oh, Helen. And then there was the incident of the puppy. What puppy? Well, stupid, really. But, Father... My God, sir, don't be so namby-pamby. I sometimes wonder what I've spawned. A boy or a girl. I can't see what's wrong in having a puppy. Lots of boys do. You call that apology a puppy? Where are you going to keep it? Hmm? In that shoebox? How long do you think it'll fit into that? I don't intend to keep it here. I'm taking it to boarding school with me. That's what the box is for. Oh, bloody well not, you know. What do you think the headmaster's going to say? Hmm? Get rid of it before term time. Meanwhile, keep the damn thing out of my sight. You see, Vincent, it was a sad little creature that David had found somewhere. Frank took an instant dislike to it, probably because it was a mongrel and a, a stray, probably the runt of the litter. He never could stand anything that wasn't perfect. Mother, are you in there? Oh, come in, darling. Hello, Mother. David, this is... Oh, yes, I, I recognize him. Uh... Your picture was in last night's paper, sir. How do you do? I've seen all your films. <laughs> Tell her, David. David enjoys the macabre. <laughs> he was a good-looking boy, sturdy and well-built for his age, a good advertisement for a country upbringing. In fact, he was everything his father should have been proud of. I noticed that he was carrying the shoebox. What's your next film going to be about? I don't know, David. As a matter of fact, I don't know what my last one was about. <laughs> How's your puppy? Is it in the box? The box? It's empty. The puppy's dead, sir. Oh, oh I David. am sorry, David. I found David. it this I... evening in one of those awful traps father laid down for the poachers. Oh. It had been struggling for hours because both its hind legs were broken. Oh, so I had to put it out of its misery. Oh, David. You mean you, you did it yourself? I had to. There was no one else about. Luckily, there was this big, flat stone. Oh, oh. David. It didn't take long. Luckily, Vincent, I've seen those traps. Frank had them put down after catching those poor devils. They're hideous and lethal. 
I've told him how dangerous they are, but he says it's the only way to stop them. The the poachers, I I'm mean. I'm not at all familiar with English law, Helen, but surely, well, he could be had up for assault or manslaughter if the worst happened. <gasps> Darling, I'm so sorry about the puppy. It's all right, Mother. Father wouldn't have let me keep it anyhow. I've got over it now. Oh, by the way, I used old Carter's wheelbarrow to carry out the guy. Yes, I saw the guy as I came in. <laughs> it looks splendid. I made it myself. It's wearing one of Father's old suits. Why don't you go out and light the bonfire? Mr. Price and I will join you presently. Take the other guests out onto the veranda, and then ask Carter to light a few of the rockets. We'll keep the set pieces till later. Oh, Mother, I nearly forgot. Father has gone. Gone? In the he had a the phone call right after supper. Something urgent at the office. He left a short while ago. Without a word. How like him. Now I'll have to apologize to everyone. I don't think he'll be missed. That will do, David. Now run along. Yes, Mother. See you later, Mr. Price. Yes, David. <laughs> Frank really is the limit. The trouble is he's trying to do too much. And I'm sure he thrives on it. No. No, he was taken quite ill at supper. Oh. He's been sleeping badly, too. The doctor gave him some pills, but they don't seem to agree with him. If anything, he's more nervy and erratic than ever. The dislike he took to David's puppy was completely irrational. It's David I'm sorry for, Helen. Yes. Poor David. Oh, look. Look, oh. they're starting the fireworks and lighting the fire. Shall we go out on the terrace? Oh, by the way, w will you be warm enough without a coat? Yes, yes. Thank you. Oh, look. They've lit the bonfire. Yes. <laughs> I've always loved this festival. <laughs> there, there it is. It's all on fire now. <laughs> You were right about the guy. Hmm? It does look so real. Hmm. That's strange. What? Do you, do you smell anything odd? No. No, I, I don't think so. I never had a chance to talk to Helen alone again that night. Suddenly I realized that it was much later than I thought and I would have to dash if I were to catch the last train. For some reason I had no wish to stay in that house and Helen was nowhere to be seen. I did see David, though, and felt that if I sent my goodbyes through him I could drop Helen a line the next day. Well, I, I never did write. An unpardonable lapse of good manners, which to this day I've never been able to explain. David stood watching the bonfire, utterly absorbed in the destruction of his handiwork. The flames licked round the straw-covered hands and the feet of the guy. He appeared to gain great satisfaction when the plank cracked and splintered, and the weird figure it had been supporting slid slowly into the holocaust below. There goes the guy, sir. See how well it burns? I soaked it in paraffin to make sure. Lucky the rain held off tonight, isn't it, sir? You're uh, really enjoying it, aren't you, David? You'll have to make a bigger one next year. Oh, next year. Won't be at all the same, sir. As I waited for the station taxi to arrive, I stood watching the spectacle. Helen had been right. There was an acrid tang in the air, which I put down to the wood smoke, possibly mixed with the approach of a November fog. There is always something splendid and grand about the slow burning of a great fire. I couldn't help comparing it with the fires used for the burning of witches and heretics at the stake, for after all, symbolically, that is what it was. The laughing guests standing round watching seemed to to lose their identity and assume other roles. They became judges, officers of the Inquisition, gleefully satisfied as their tortured victims turned and twisted and shriveled in the purging flames. <laughs> I guess that's 
what being an actor does for you. The sanatorium. It's just here on the right. Wake up, sir. We're nearly there. Mm. Oh, I, I wasn't asleep, David. What became of your father? My father? Oh, didn't I tell you? No. We never saw him again after that night he left Mother. There were rumours that he had some girlfriend waiting for him in London. Mother had to carry on alone. Weren't inquiries made? Didn't you try to trace him? Trace him? Do you think we wanted him back? I loathed and detested the ground he walked on. So did Mother. His going was the best thing that ever happened to us. He was a brute when he was here, and I hope to God he's dead now. He is, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, we're here. I followed him into the large house. I felt unhappy and apprehensive. I still couldn't decide if I were right to come. My qualms grew as we approached Helen's room. She was sitting on the bed, huddled and emaciated, her hair gray and lank. For a moment I thought there must have been some mistake. This couldn't be Helen. Not the Helen I'd known as a student, nor indeed the hostess of Rycott Manor. Why had it come to this? Vincent? Hello, Helen. Is it really you? It's been so long. Ten years, Helen. You were right, Vincent, weren't you? You told me not to marry Frank. You must forget it and try to get well. I will never get oh, well. Now, Helen, the doctor says you're much better. David is outside. Won't you see your son? I have no son. Tell me what's wrong. Won't you let me help you? You can't help me. No one can. Well, then just see David. No, I'll fetch him no, for you. No, I won't see anyone. No, no. It's all right, Mrs. Thomas. Now, calm down. Nobody's forcing you to do anything. Should I leave? Don't... No, no, please don't go. Don't leave me. Just a few moments then, sir. Do you remember that night, Vincent? And that smell, that dreadful smell? Helen, I can't smell anything. <laughs> it's all right, sir. It's one of her fantasies. And the pills... Has anybody looked for the sleeping pill? Helen, Helen, my dear, please be quiet. If I could only find out what's troubling you. Oh, Vincent, I looked for you, but you're gone. Why did you go off and leave me? You never even said goodbye. You never wrote, not a word. Helen, I know, I, I really... It doesn't matter, not anymore. Nothing matters now. I have something to tell you, Vincent. Yes. I'm going to marry Frank Thomas. He's rich and he's got a lovely Stop house. Stop it, Helen. No, no, that's not it. It's something I must remember. I, I must tell you, Vincent. I've got all I want, but there's no love in this house, and it frightens oh, me. Oh, my dear, I... I've got a wonderful son, Vincent. His name is David. And he hates his father. Helen. I'm all right, Vincent. Don't pity me, please. Don't pity me. Listen, Vincent. Listen to me. There isn't much time. I'm all right. I must tell you. That night, while it's in my mind, Frank was taken ill after supper. David had been sitting next to his father on his right next to the wine glass. What are you saying, Helen? Don't you understand, Vincent? I can't say any more. Oh, God, what's the use? What's the use? Oh, please, Helen, don't. Please. Please go, Vincent. I'm tired. So tired. David, your mother is obsessed with that night, the night your father walked out on her. There's something I didn't tell you. Oh. I looked up part of our family records. There's insanity there. Mother's illness appears to be hereditary. But does that make it incurable? Not necessarily. This is what I want to research. Nobody really knows how to define hereditary insanity. Perhaps when I'm qualified, I'll be able to help. Two years later, Helen was dead, still without being reconciled to her son. The last time I saw David was at her funeral. Of course, I followed his career with interest, knighted at 35 and now dead at 37. Back in my flat, I sat in front of the fire. The flames danced in front of my eyes, and my fireplace assumed the shape of a 
bonfire. Without any prompting from me, the string of clues that I possessed, as yet unconnected, flashed through my mind. Whether they were clues to what really happened or might have happened, I could not tell. But they didn't make a pretty story. David was there when the poachers were brought out dead. Burnt, blackened and scorched. Both the puppy's hind legs were broken. It had been struggling for hours. And I've seen those traps. They're hideous and lethal. The shoebox, it's empty. 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 It can't be. I can't believe it. Frank was taken ill at supper. David was sitting next to him, next to the wine glass. Nobody looked for the sleeping pills. By the way, I used old Carter's wheelbarrow. I made the guy myself. Self, self, self. Myself. Myself. Self, self, self. That boy? No, it's just not possible. I've got a wonderful son. He hates his father. See how well it burns? I poured some paraffin to make sure. That dreadful smell. Don't you understand, Vincent? Don't, don't, don't you? Don't you? Don't, 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 you. Don't, don't, you. Could it really have happened like that? A boy brooding on his father's cruelty, his hand poised over a wine glass, substituting the original guy stuffing straw into the sleeves and trouser ends, a sturdy and well-built boy who could drag the body of a man into a wheelbarrow, tied to a plank, easy enough. I remembered how uncannily lifelike the guy had seemed, and the roasting of human flesh would have left an acrid, sour smell, wouldn't it? I remembered what David had said in the car. Hadn't he told me himself that his mother's illness was hereditary? And if it was hereditary, why should it stop there? As I picked up the newspaper that had fallen to the floor, the last line of the article caught my eye. Found inexplicably amongst the dead man's papers was an old shoebox full of some charred and blackened substance, which was later identified as human flesh and bone. Guy Fawkes' Night was first recounted and dramatized by Richard Davis and produced by John Dyers. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Quiet, Green. Quiet, please. System presents Quiet Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet Please for tonight is called Rain on New Year's Eve. Yeah, it's raining again. Pretty near New Year's and it's raining again. Back east, it's probably snowing different places. Or maybe the moon's out and shining on the snow and people are saying, why, it's so bright out you can read a newspaper. They can't read a newspaper by moonlight, only the headlines. Maybe if you take your newspaper out in the yard and stand in the moonlight, you might find a headline with my name in it. It's been there before. Well, anyway, so there's moonlight. Yeah, there's rain. 
Like it was that other New Year's Eve. That's what the rain makes me think of. As if I ever thought of anything else. Listen to the rain. I was sitting in my office in the writer's court out there after we'd been on the picture for two or three months. Writing it, that is. They'd been shooting for about three weeks, but I was still on the picture because we had a producer that couldn't make up his mind, and the director was one of those guys, a sort of road company Hitchcock, you know. He makes the picture up as he goes along. Only there has to be a writer filed away someplace where he can find him when he runs out of ideas, which is not more than 11 times a day. So I'm dying. I go on the set and I find actors there I never heard of, speaking lines I never wrote in scenes I couldn't figure out. Then the director would get me in a corner and put the arm on me. This thing doesn't seem to quite gel, old man. You know? And me and my little typewriter go to work to unscrew things while the overtime and the gin army games go right out. <laughs> Great life, that. Well, so I'm sitting in my office and the rain is on the roof and the gas heater is frying my ankles while the draft from the window is giving my neck the deep freeze. Mary Lou, my secretary, comes in from her little cubby hole next to mine. When do I get to do my Christmas shopping, Mr. Van? You don't get to do your Christmas shopping, Mary Lou. Yes, I know. I didn't. What? Christmas was two days ago, Mr. Ramsey. Was it? Well, Merry Christmas. Are we ever going to finish this picture, for heaven's sake? Well, I'll tell you, Angel. Mr. Doty, the great director, is getting $3,500 a week. I know it. And, my dear, Mr. Doty has not got $3,500 a week for a long, long time, see? Uh -huh. So, Mr. Doty, the great director, is going to make $3,500 a week just as long as he possibly can, and characters like us can, you know what. That man. I have a different word for him, sweetheart. But as I was saying, if we leave it to Mr. Doty, this here picture ain't never going to be finished. A hundred years from now, somebody will come upstairs here and they'll find an old, old man with a long white beard. Meaning out the 59th revision of scene 456. And in the next room, a little apple cheeked old lady. I'll cut it out. Yeah. Oh, when are they going to finish it? No kidding. New Year's Eve. Oh, well, maybe there'll be champagne and stuff on the set. Yeah, no doubt. For the expensive actors and the producers and the fine, upstanding director. For you and me, a nice bottle of 60-cent claret imported from right over there on Ventura Boulevard. You're so funny. Mm, on the contrary. Well, I'm getting awful sick of this, Mr. Ramsey. We've had to work every single night for the last four weeks. Do you realize that? You kidding? Do I realize? Go get me some coffee, will you, kid? I gotta stay awake, Mr. Doty. Coffee. I bet you and I could be elected president of Brazil all the coffee we've put away. Answer the phone. It's Doty. Well, we gotta be dignified. Oh, no, and Mr. Andrew's office. Who's calling to you? Oh, yes, Mr. Doty. He's here. I'm always here. Ramsey. Yes, Mr. Doty. What seems to be the trouble? I see. Yes, I see, but Mr. Doty, I... Well... Well, then I mean rewriting practically all the... Well, yes, I know, I mean... Uh... But what do you gain that way? Well, I have two monsters. Well, what's two monsters got that one monster hasn't? Oh, yeah, sure, but who scares who? Uh, who am I mean? But, Mr. Doty, I saw a picture once with two monsters in it, and it was silly. What? Oh, you directed it. Well, uh, well, well, I'll, I'll be right over. Skip the coffee, Mary Lou. Cool, Ramsey. Two. Count them two. And I'll lay you six, two, and even, that by the time I get to the stage, you'll be hollering for three. And take your raincoat. It's raining pitchforks. Maybe one of them will stab me. I better tell you about this monster stuff. Uh, this was a horror picture, you see. Kind of the poor man's Frankenstein. Yeah, they couldn't get Karloff, naturally, and 
They couldn't use the Frankenstein monster makeup because Jack Pierce over at Universal invented that. I guess Universal owned it. So they had me dream up a monster. And boy, did I dream one up. There's an old book. It's called... No, I guess I won't tell you what it's called. We didn't want to take those old books too seriously. So I kind of swiped this monster out of the book. Well, you'll never see the picture, I suppose, so maybe I better tell you a little about him. No, I guess I won't either. He was... He was the most horrible monster I ever saw. No kidding. And what the makeup department did with my sketch and my description. Oh, boy. Just one thing I'll tell you about him, and you can figure out the rest for yourself. He didn't have any face. You take it from there. But don't kid yourself. He was a thing. They got Ollie Tharp to play the goon. Nice fella, quiet, always grinning, modest. Good actor. Last guy in the world you'd expect to play a monster. Oh, yeah, sure. Karloff did the Frankenstein thing, and he's the mildest-mannered guy in the world. I remember him on the Son of Frankenstein set years ago, in his monster suit all gray and green, showing pictures of his new baby to people. <laughs> I had to laugh. Well, I, I guess monsters are human sometimes, huh? And maybe humans are... Yeah. Well, all right. I spent three hours listening to Mr. Doty run off at the mouth with the whole company having the screaming memes over all this nonsense. It's five minutes to twelve when he finally decides to quit and everybody goes home. They're all burned at Doty, but well, they'll wake up in the morning, remember the overtime, and they'll feel better. Me? Writers don't get overtime. So I get back to the writer's court and the light's burning on the window and Mary Lou is snoring away with her face in a stack of carbon paper. She wakes up and asks me a question. How many monsters now? We got four now. Say, including me. So the next morning it's not raining anymore. The sun is shining bright. And you can see snow on top of the mountains, and it's a very nice day. And monsters are pretty hazy in my mind as I pick up my copy of the reporter and head for the rickety stairway to my palatial office. I'll tell you how much good the sunshine did me. I was whistling as I climbed up the stairs and opened the door. You might as well turn off the whistle. Mr. Doty's looking for you. And now what? He says it's very important. Yeah, two more monsters. Your coffee's on your desk. Steaming cold, no doubt. I just brought it up. Give me 15 cents. Well, I did your turn to buy this morning. I bought yesterday. All right, all right. Hello, no, he isn't here yet. Now, go ahead. Mr. Ramsey's office. Yes, Mr. Doty. Morning, Mr. Doty. How are you? Oh? No kidding. Why, that's fine. What? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. What's up? Why, sure, Mr. Doty. Yes, sir, I'll be right over. What? He has to finish the picture definitely by 12 midnight, December 31st. Oh, that's what you said last night. Oh, I was kidding. You know how it goes in the story. I forgot. Well, I mean the way it was originally. You know, this, this monster only has power the last hour of the year. Oh, yes. Remember, it was a New Year's party, the whole picture? It's been so long ago, I forgot how it started. Well, don't you remember our big payoff scene? She thinks the monster is her wicked uncle? Who thinks? You know, the babe with the teeth. The groom girl with a blue dress. Oh, yes. Remember, she, she thinks the monster is her uncle and she tries to rip his mask off and it ain't a man? Something like and the house is on fire and he grabs her and runs inside the house and our hero busts in after her and rescues her. Some way I never had a chance to figure out. How would he do it without his glasses? He'd fall over the stoop. What stoop? There's hundreds of them in pictures. Drink your coffee and go see Mr. Doty. Maybe he's changed his mind. I can't change his mind. The front office puts a big fat arm on him, or else. <laughs> Whoopie, baby, three days and we can sit down and rest. Away from this place. You can say that again. 
Tell him what he ain't here. Well, sir, that sunshine looked better than ever to me. But when the big door of the stage swung shut behind me, the sunshine sure disappeared. Well, Mr. Doty was an unhappy man. Well, three more days and there wouldn't be any more of those $3,500 is. And he didn't like it a little bit. And guess who he took it out on? This is the worst story I ever had to work with. It positively smells bad. I didn't say. It's your story, Mr. Doty. All I got left is a monster, and he'll probably turn out to be Santa Claus or somebody. Did you listen to me when I told you how to do it? I didn't say. I listened to you, Mr. Doty, and now look what we got. Now I have to give up my beautiful idea of having three monsters instead of one. Because then we'd have had to reshoot practically the whole picture, and you'd have made another million bucks. I didn't say that either. So, if you think you could possibly dredge up your original script, I think I can possibly make it into an acceptable B picture. Although that's a task even for a director like me. Mr. Doty doesn't realize what an unconscious humorist he is. That guy could make a B picture out of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Even if he had the original cast. Oh, get to work. Get to work and do something. Have I got to do everything around here? Get a move on you. Oh, I got a move on me. Even if you think I dislike that guy up to now. What? I need that to be the last two days. You've got to get some sleep so far. He's been on his feet for almost two days, Mr. Ramsey. Yeah. Oh. Scene, where were we? Scene 168. Long shot and fury and match tonight. From the top of the stairway, the figure appears full of stamps in the shadows. We insert rather than see in the twisted evil fall of the monster as he steers over the balustrade. From the foreground right, the butler appears and stops slowly up the stairway. As he reaches the fourth or fifth step, a terror starts to move in the parlor. With crayon of sand and the camera holes on the mass three steps as the butler receives the cup. Up to... Hey, wake up! Oh, oh. oh I'm sorry. Where were we? Ramsey, you've got to get for the scene. Night out, Kevin. Yeah, it sure like. Mr. Ramsey's off. No, I'm not here. Yes, Mr. Doty. All right. All right, all right. Hello? Yes? Sure. I'll be right over. Oh, Mr. Ramsey, I was... You know what, Mary Lou? Oh, put on your coat. It's raining again. You know what? What? I wish I was a monster. <laughs> you know, I was a tired little fellow. I didn't have any Thanksgiving. I ate a Ben Ham sandwich in my office that day because Mr. Doty had to have three new scenes Friday morning. He called me at the office to see how I was doing. He just finished his Thanksgiving dinner. I didn't have any Christmas. I locked the door in my office and baked my brains out on a whole new sequence which the Doty had caught up. All around me, people were drinking whiskey and chasing each other through the corridors and up and down the stairs. I didn't have any Sundays. I didn't have any evenings. I, my friend, damn near lost my mind. Oh. All the time, Mr. Doty. Wow. That's no wonder that by New Year's Eve I was ready to hire a man with a cleaver to extirpate the guy. But I didn't. Nope, I sure didn't. At nine o'clock he called me over to the set again. Could I rewrite some dialogue? <laughs> well, I crossed him up on that one. I threw out the hash he'd made of my original dialogue and substituted what I'd originally written. It played okay. After seven different takes, all exactly alike. And I went back to my office in the rain. Mr. Ramsey's office. Yes, Mr. Doty. Yes, Mr. Doty. I'll tell him. Mr. Ramsey. No, I heard you. He needs you right away again. Okay, I'll come. Of course, thing. I'll need another couple hours. Hope I can take it. Take your rain, Coast. It's Ram, Captain Dog. It's L.A. Mitty. That time it was a little piece of action he couldn't get through his ivory head. 
I explained it in words of one syllable, carefully avoiding the four-letter one. He thanked me, old boy. And I went out into the rain again. Rain. What? What rain in California can do to you? I heard of a fellow that jumped into the Los Angeles River once after a week of rain. Ordinarily, he'd break his ankle, but he drowned. You know, it just comes down steadily. I know I could probably be a lot more graphic than that, but that's all there is to rain in California. It comes down steadily. Ice cold. Steadily. Yeah, of course, it always stops about the time you've decided to start out on foot for the east. The sun shines, and poinsettias bloom, and the hills are green. Well, man, that's wonderful. I guess they have the rain like hitting yourself on the head with a hammer. It feels so good when you stop. Yeah, that's a bum gag, but I was a pretty beat-up character. Three more times that New Year's Eve, in the rain. The guy getting meaner and meaner each time. Well, at least it was going to be over pretty soon. Ten minutes to eleven when I came into the office and Mary Lou took my coat from me. You just got to get a little sleep, Ramsey. Now you sit down at your desk and put your head down and catch forty wings. Ah, thanks, Mary Lou. And I don't know if I had to see that man just one more time tonight. It would be responsible. I'm not kidding. I know. You go to see the kid here is all in as I am. Well, at least I don't have to face him. He's got to stop at midnight. As soon as he's through, should you and me go someplace and have a New Year's drink? I, I don't know, but I could keep awake. Well, let's try, huh? Okay. Anybody ever tell you you're a nice gal? Couple of tea, Connie. <laughs> I could marry a gal like you. Don't hit people, Ramsey. I'm not. See how you feel when you wake up. I think I love you. I wish you meant that, Ramsey. I do. Yes, I'm good night. Ramsey, you're sweet. Yes, I'm good night. Oh. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, go to sleep. So I went to sleep. So I went to sleep. And I dreamed. Even when I was asleep, I couldn't get that guy duty off my mind. I dreamed I was on the set. I dreamed they were shooting the last scene, the one where the monster comes closer and closer to the camera. Till that head of his without any face fills the whole screen. You know how it is in dreams. You're here. You now all of a sudden you're there and you're one guy and then you're another and that's all mixed up. Yes. I could see the set. And I could hear Doty call now. Quiet. Run. Breathe. Exit. Then I could see this faceless monster coming out in the shadows. Slowly... Slowly, right up to the camera where George Robinson was standing, tired as everybody else. And I thought to myself, if the audience had any idea that little old milk toast Ali Farp was inside that monster rig, <laughs> they'd fight. Then in the dream, I saw Doody jumping up and down in one of those silly rages of tears to be out of it. Get back there, fight it over. You got about as much medicine as last word of medicine as a whiskey over there. Wait till the night dreams he was picking on me. And so they started all over again. My dream got kind of mixed up all right there, and, and I sort of seemed to be following the monster, because I could see Dodie's face right in front of me. The monster moved in. When Dodie yelled, cut again, the monster and I didn't stop. I just sort of seemed to follow it right on, farther and farther. I saw the monster's... Big hairy hands grabbed Dodie, and Dodie screamed, and the monster's hands were fumbling at Dodie's neck. Dodie was fighting, and I thought Dodie bite the monster's hand. It was so real, I could almost feel it. And then everything got black in my dream, and 
and there were a lot of a lot of bells ringing, and well, that's what woke me up. So I raised my head, and of course, there I was in my office. And then I pulled my belt out of it a little, and then I knew what the bells were. They were bells ringing in the new year. The rain was hammering on the roof, and it was tomorrow. So I got up and hollered for Mary Lou. Mary Lou! Hey, Happy New Year, Mary Lou! And she didn't answer it. I stepped through the door into her little office. And she was lying on the floor behind her desk. And the look on her face was something I never want to see again. It was the look of the most awful horror anybody could imagine. The kind of look you'd expect to see on the face of someone who'd been literally frightened to death by a monster who had no face at all. So I stood there. After a few seconds, I heard people yelling outside. I heard somebody yell at Holly Thorpe had killed Doty. Somebody else said, no, Holly Thorpe was dead too with a broken neck in his dressing room. And my hand hurt. When I raised my hand to look at it, right across the thick of my mom were teeth marks. Deep, bloody teeth marks where Doty had bit me and I strangled him. So you see, that's why I say never take any of those old books too seriously. Remember I said I wished I was a monster? Remember what the book said? The monster only possessed his Murder is power for one hour, the last hour of the year. New Year's Eve again, and it's raining. You got anybody you want, Marie? You'll have listened to Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell, and Muriel Kirkland was Mary Lou, Pat O'Malley was Doty. Music for Quiet, Please is composed and played by Albert Berman. Now, for a word about next week's Quiet, Please, here is our writer director, my good friend, Willis Cooper. I have a story for you next week about a man who was haunted. It's called The Little Visitor. And so until next week at this time, I am quietly yours, Vernon Chapel. The Quiet Please comes to you from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Sealed Book.
Once again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault, wherein is kept the great sealed book, in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book, I would know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly, the great book opens. One by one, the keeper of the book turns the pages and stops. Ah, the strange story of a beautiful young actress who tried the most difficult role of her life when she impersonated death to win a prize of millions of dollars. A tale titled, Death Rings Down the Curtain. the tale, Death Rings Down the Curtain, as it is written in the pages of the sealed book. In the darkened bedroom of Martha Richards, a room where the blinds are always shut, young Dr. Smith is listening intently through his stethoscope to the laboring heart of his elderly, crotchety patient. Well, how much longer are you going to keep thumping me with that stethoscope, you old quack? I've finished examining you now. Well, don't just stand there without saying a word. How am I? How much time have I got left? Well, that's difficult to say. If you will avoid all excitement, I think I can say a year, possibly two. Hmm, a year, possibly two. Yes, but only if you do as I say. Now, there's no reason at all why you should insist on remaining in this darkened bedroom month after month. Well, it's been a year since you've been out of this room. Oh, you're going to start on that again. And what's more, Mrs. Richards, this living in utter seclusion is bad for your health. You should leave this room and see people. No, Doctor, no. I won't have my maid pushing me around in a wheelchair, the object of everyone's pity. I prefer to remain in this room and have people think of me as I was, not as I am. Ah, very well. Only I can't see why you refuse to have visitors. It would give you some interest in life. It may surprise you to know, Doctor, that I'm expecting two visitors, though it isn't because of anything you've said. I'm sure it isn't. But the way my heart is, I think it's about time I was drawing up a will. Before I do so, I want to get acquainted with my only living relatives, a niece and a nephew from my husband's side of the family. And they're the two visitors you're expecting? Yes. I haven't seen Gerald and Mildred since they were children. I'm very curious to see what they grew up to be like. I understand Mildred's an actress. An actress? You don't mean that Millie Richards is your niece, do you? Yes. Have you heard of her? Of course. Everyone has. She's one of Broadway's leading actresses. I saw her in a play recently and thought she was excellent. Mm. Probably drinks and smokes and has been married three or four times. And her brother Gerald is probably an heir to wheel who's never worked a day in his life. Aren't you being a bit unfair, judging the two of them before you've even seen them? That remains to be seen, Doctor. Before I draw up my will, I intend to learn everything about them. I'll give them both every opportunity to prove they're worthy of part of the Richards' fortune. When do you expect them? Well, they said they'd be here in time for dinner, which means they should be on their way here now. <laughs> How's the hangover, brother dear? Painful, I hope. Uh, what, the, what am I doing in this car? 
Where are we going? Have you forgotten, darling? This is the day we were invited to visit Aunt Martha. Uh, you remember dear old Aunt Martha. She's the one with all that lovely money. Oh, save it, will you? I'm in no mood for your witticisms. Considering that I spent half of last night looking for you under nightclub tables, Gerald, you might be a little more grateful. Oh, my head. What a night. Yes, wasn't it, darling? Every place I went looking for you, they gave me IOUs you'd left behind. Exactly how much do you owe around town? Eleven thousand dollars. Millie, you've got to help me. If I don't pay up soon, I'll be in real trouble. What exactly am I supposed to do? You've got to lend me enough money to hold off my creditors. Lend you money? <laughs> you may not know it, brother dear, but I'm far deeper in debt than you are. But you were getting a thousand a week as the lead in Let Us Be Merry. How can you possibly be in debt? It's all very simple, darling. I was getting a thousand a week and spending two thousand a week. That makes everything just perfect. Both of us so deeply in debt, we probably don't dare go back to town. Perhaps after our visit to Aunt Martha, we will be able to go back to town. What do you mean by that? Why do you think Aunt Martha sent us an invitation to visit her? Your guess is as good as mine. Aunt Martha's getting on in years, and I, unless I'm very much mistaken, she's decided to drop a will. Naturally, before doing so, she wants to see what her only living relatives are like. Millie, do you really think she'll leave us some money? If we play our cards right, all we've got to do is convince Aunt Martha that we deserve it. And how are we going to do that? By showing her that we're lovable, simple, and unspoiled. Uh-huh. Gerald, do you remember the ancient role I played in I Dream of Love? Yes, of course. You weren't half bad. Half bad? Why, I was superb. The critics were mad about me. How dare you say I was only oh, half right, bad? All right, you were superb. What about it? I think I shall play that role for Aunt Martha. Just a simple, unsophisticated girl, untouched by success. How am I supposed to behave? I'm no actor. You just play the strong, silent type, Gerald, and leave all the talking to me. And when the curtain rings down on my special performance for Aunt Martha, the Richard's fortune will be ours. <laughs> Come in. Hello, Aunt Martha. It's us, Aunt Martha. Oh, come in, Mildred. Gerald? Well, it's been quite a number of years since we've seen each other, hasn't it? Yes, it has been, Aunt Martha. I, I've been meaning to call on you for ever so long, Aunt Martha, but something always interfered at the last moment. Hmm. Well, what finally brought you here? Well, when you mentioned in your letter that you were ill and would like to see us, I simply couldn't stay away. I dropped everything to come here. I'm extremely grateful. Of course, the fact that you might possibly get an inheritance had nothing to do with it. Why, Aunt Martha, what a thing to say. Aunt Martha Millie doesn't need money. Why, she's one of the finest actresses on Broadway. So I've heard, so I've heard. What do you do for a living, Gerald? Uh, huh? Uh, what do I do? Yes, Gerald, what do you do? Oh, uh, Gerald works for a Wall Street firm, Aunt Martha. Yes, he works so hard, and they pay him so little. Well, unless I'm very much mistaken, Gerald was left quite a sizable inheritance by his father. Whatever became of that? Uh, the inheritance? Oh, that was uh, lost in poor investments, Aunt Martha. I see. Well, I'm afraid there's a good deal about you two that I don't know. I haven't done very much. I haven't gotten very far, Aunt Martha, but Millie has really been a credit to the family name. Everyone's heard of her. Hmm. Now, see here. I want you and Millie to be my guests for a week. Frankly, I want to know what you're like before I draw up my will. Of course, Aunt Martha. And I do hope that you'll take care of yourself so that you'll live for years and years. Uh, thank you, Millie. Now, I'm afraid I must ask you two to leave as I'm a bit tired. Why, well, certainly, Aunt Martha. If we can do anything for you, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. I'm glad we're out of there. The old lady stares at a person as though she can see through him. The room's so dark, it was difficult to see her. But you can tell she won't last much longer. Yes, but the main point is, did she fall for our little act? If you ask me, your performance hardly swept her off her feet. Nonsense. I played my role perfectly. Just give me a week, darling, and you and I will be the sole heirs to the Richard's fortune. <laughs>
to continue the story. Death rings down the curtain as it is written in the sealed book. For a week, Millie and Gerald have been living with their Aunt Martha, trying to convince her that they are worthy of inheriting her great fortune. And Millie, sure that they have succeeded, is waiting for Gerald to return to tell him the news. Hello, Millie. Gerald, where have you been all night? I've looked everywhere for you. I spent the night in town. What? Well, you've been drinking. So what? Oh, you fool! What if Aunt Martha were to hear about it, just when everything's working out perfectly? So everything's working out perfectly, is it? Yes. I told you, if you'd leave her to me, it would. Last night, Aunt Martha made a phone call to New York. Gerald, it was her attorney she was calling, and he's coming here tonight to draw up her will. You don't say. Well, well. Well, you don't sound very enthusiastic at being named one of Aunt Martha's heirs. My dear Millie, it may interest you to know that the greatest performance of your career has gone for nothing. What do you mean? You may be able to sweep a Broadway audience off its feet, but not Aunt Martha. Oh, why, I tell you, she believes in me utterly. Oh, does she? Yes, she does. It may come as quite a shock, but while Aunt Martha was listening so devotedly to your every word, she had a private investigator in New York at work investigating. A private investigator? You mean Aunt Martha's been checking on our past? That's the general information I received. That double-crossing old hag. Yes, and no doubt you can guess what she'll do when she learns that I haven't a job on Wall Street and that I gambled my inheritance away. And what do you think she'll say when she hears you were named as correspondent in three divorce actions and were involved in the Wainwright scandal? Oh, I'd like to scratch out those staring eyes of hers, playing with me like a cat with a mouse. Well, the game's up. We may as well go up to our rooms and pack. What? Walk out on a $4 million inheritance? I should say not. There must be something we can do about it. Yes, well, what, for example? I don't know yet. Let me think. I won't go back to the city beaten, deeply in debt. And Martha may think she's clever, but she won't beat me. Before she cuts me out of her will, I'll... Yes. What are you planning, Millie? Gerald, if we play our cards right, you and I will inherit the entire Richard's fortune in spite of anything Aunt Martha can do. Now, listen, this is what I... As Millie explained her idea, Gerald's face became white. But in spite of his fears, he finally agreed to do exactly as Billy asked. Then in the hours that followed, Millie locked herself in her room and practiced her aunt's signature over and over until she was finally satisfied. And that evening, as the clock struck eight, Millie and Gerald silently stole down the hall to the door of their aunt's room. Millie, let's not go through with this. It's madness. Quiet, you fool. I tell you, it's the only way out. But what if we're caught? You know what that'd mean. I tell you, we won't be caught if you do exactly as I say. I've everything worked out perfectly to the last detail. Get hold of yourself. I'm going to knock. You know exactly what you're to do. Yes. Come in. Good evening, Aunt Martha. I, uh, I hope you're feeling well, Aunt Martha. Oh, Mildred, Gerald, eh? Come in. Thank you. It's, uh... It's quite dark in here, Aunt Martha. Would you like me to turn on a light? No, no, Gerald, that isn't necessary. I'm quite used to being in the dark. Of course. How are you feeling this evening? Much better, thank you. Gerald, perhaps you ought to fix Aunt Martha's pillows. She doesn't seem very comfortable. No, 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 you needn't bother. I'm quite comfortable, I assure you. Uh, Gerald, fix Aunt Martha's pillows. I can't go through with it, you hear? I can't. Oh, I should have known better than to come from you. Mildred, what's Gerald talking about? Nothing important, Aunt Martha. Here, uh, let me fix this pillow I for you. I tell you, I don't want Millie, it. Millie, don't. Mildred, don't. <laughs> Millie, don't. She's suffocating. Quiet, do you hear? If you haven't got the nerve to go through with it, I have. There. I think that's enough to bring on a heart attack. <sighs> How do you feel, Aunt Martha? You're, you're nothing but a murderess. And... Oh, my heart attack. Millie, is she... is she dead? Yes, Gerald, and not from suffocation, but from a heart attack. I told you it would work out. I had nothing to do with it, do you hear? You murdered her, I didn't. In the eyes of the law, Gerald, you're my accomplice. Nothing you might say can make it otherwise. We haven't time to discuss that. Aunt Martha's attorney should be here in an hour. Now, will you do as I say, or won't you? I have no choice in the matter. No, you're acting sensibly. 
do exactly as I say and we can't fail. I just stopped in front of the house. It must be Mr. Jordan, Aunt Martha's attorney. Hmm, he certainly is punctual. Are you ready? I need a little more shading here under my eyes. Hurry, Millie. He'll be up here in a minute. Gerald, I've never been late for a curtain yet, and I won't be late for this one. There. Now, help me on with Aunt Martha's bedrobe. All right. There. Now, how do I look, Gerald? Are you... You look exactly like Aunt Martha. If I didn't know her body was in that closet, I'd swear you were her. In the dim light of this room, no one can help but take me for Aunt Martha. Yes, but what about your voice and the things you may have to know? Just listen to this. Don't be ridiculous, Gerald. As mistress of this house, I answer only those questions which I wish to answer, and I assure you I shall not be tripped up. Does that convince you? Yes, I'm convinced. Really quick, get in bed. I hear someone coming. Gerald, and please stop shaking. I tell you, we can't fail. I shall give the greatest performance of my career. And now to continue the story, Death Rings Down the Curtain, as it is written in the sealed book. Swiftly, Millie, made up to look like her dead Aunt Martha, slips into her aunt's bed, and then, as Gerald lights a cigarette with trembling fingers, someone knocks at the door. Come in. Good evening, Mr. Jordan. Come in, won't you? Well, well, Mrs. Richards, how are you? Why, bless me, it's been over a year since I've seen you. Really, Mr. Jordan? Has it been that long? Certainly has. How are your eyes? Still troubling you? My eyes? Oh, they're much better, thank you. Well, that's fine, Mrs. Richards. Oh, oh, by the way, this is Mr. Wilson, my secretary. How do you do? I'm happy to meet you, Mrs. Richards. I don't think, Mr. Jordan, you've met my nephew, Gerald Richards. Gerald, this is my attorney, Mr. Jordan. Hello. How do you do, Mr. Richards? Uh, Mr. Jordan, I want to have a will drawn up and signed tonight. Tonight? Mm. Surely you can't be serious, Mrs. Richards. After all, your your vast holdings require a will that will take you days to draw oh, up. No nonsense. I'll have none of your involved 40-page wills. All I want is a simple will dividing my entire estate equally between my nephew Gerald and my niece Mildred. But, Mrs. Richards, there are so many other details that enter into the matter of a will. Uh, for example, we must consider that... Uh, Mr. Jordan, that, uh... will you do as I say? Or must I get another attorney to draw up my will? Very well, Mrs. Richards. Mr. Wilson, please draw up a will dividing the entire estate between Gerald Richards and Mildred... Uh, Mildred Jones. Richards. She's Gerald's sister. Yes, thank you. I'll take care of it at once, Mr. Jordan. You mean, Mr. Jordan, you've never heard of my niece, Mildred Richards, the Broadway actress? Oh, you mean Millie Richards. Why, yes, of course. I've seen her in quite a number of plays. Oh, really? What do you think of her? Well, frankly, Mrs. Richards, I, 
I think your niece has a tendency to overact. Oh, you do, do you? Uh, yes. Uh, take this last play she was in, um, uh, Let Us Be Merry. Now, I think she played it far too hard for comedy. I'd have preferred to see an actress like, uh, say, Joan Walker play that role. Well, that's only your opinion. I should like you to hear what the critics had to say about her performance. Uh, Gerald, will you please hand me Millie's scrapbook? You'll find it on my desk there. Oh, really, Aunt Martha, don't you think uh, you please, ought to... Please, Gerald... Oh, very well. I can understand criticism, and it's justified, Mr. Jordan, but it seems to me you're going against my niece's huge public. Here's Millie's scrapbook, Aunt Martha. Uh, thank you, Gerald. Ah, uh, just a moment, Mr. Jordan, and I'll read you what the critics had to say about Millie's performance and let us be merry. Yes, I'd like to hear it. Ah, here we are. This is what Martin Walters, dramatic critic of the evening Sentinel, had to say. Hmm. Rarely in 30 years of theater going has this reviewer seen such a fine flair for comedy as was displayed last night by Millie Richards in her new hit, Let Us Be Merry, and that, Mr. Jordan, is the opinion of one of the finest critics in the country. Well, I, I may be wrong, Mrs. Richards. Uh, naturally, I was only venturing a personal opinion when I said... I have Mrs. Richards well prepared, Mr. Jordan. I use the standard form. Oh, yes. Let's have a look at it. Hmm... Yes, it seems to be all in order. You're sure that will, Mr. Jordan, will stand up in court? Oh, yes. Uh, only you'll be leaving a good many um, unsettled problems to your heirs. Yeah, it's quite all right. I'm sure they're capable of taking care of them. Your secretary can be one of the witnesses, can't he? Yes, Mrs. Richards, and uh, your maid can be the other. Uh, very well. Now, I'll sign first. Uh, there you are. That's fine. Now I'll have the two witnesses sign it, and everything will be in order. Good. I'm quite happy now that it's all settled. You look tired, Aunt Martha. Uh, I am, Gerald, I am. Are you finished, Mr. Jordan? Yes, Miss Richards. Good. Mary will show you and Mr. Wilson to your rooms. I'll see you in the morning. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Richards. Good night. They're gone. Well, Gerald, I told you it would work. We aren't through this yet. Don't be a fool. The money is as good as ours. All we have to do is put Aunt Martha back in this bed. Tomorrow morning, her maid will discover her dead body, and you and I will inherit everything. The next morning, things went exactly as Millie had foreseen. The maid found the old woman's body in her bed as if she had died in her sleep, and Dr. Smith was summoned at once. After a brief examination, he was satisfied that Martha Richards' tired heart had simply given out during the night. Oh, oh, I can't believe it somehow, Doctor. And Martha was such a dear. It's impossible to believe she's really dead. You mustn't feel too badly, Miss Richards. It was all over quite quickly, I'm sure. Your aunt's heart simply gave out. But she seemed so strong and well when we left her last night. Why, when she and I were arguing, it was just like old times. You mean you and Mrs. Richards had an argument last night? Oh, not really an argument, Doctor. They were just debating over my sister's ability as an actress. Yes, that's all it was. I, I hope you won't mind, Miss Richards, but uh, when I told your aunt, I thought that you overplayed your roles. Oh, that's quite all right, Mr. Jordan. What did she say to that? <laughs> she almost hit the ceiling when I criticized you. She claimed that you're the finest actress in the country. Oh, Aunt Martha was always a dear. Strange that she should have said that, considering that she never saw Miss Richards perform. Well, maybe she hadn't, but she pulled out a book of clippings about Miss Richards and read me what one of the critics had said about her niece. She did what? She read me what one of the critics had said about Miss Richards' ability as an actress. I see. Mr. Jordan... I think your criticism of Miss Richards that she overplays is justified. I beg your pardon. I never over overplayed a role in my life. I'm afraid, Miss Richards, that you overplayed one last night. Last night? What do you mean? Your Aunt Martha was an extremely proud woman. She couldn't stand to be pitied. Exactly a year ago, she became blind. <gasps> and when she did, she refused to leave her room and allow people to know she'd lost her sight. Only two people knew her blindness, her maid and myself. But if Mrs. Richards was blind, how could she have read me that notice last night? She didn't, Mr. Jordan. An egomaniac actress disguised as Mrs. Richards read her own notice to you. Isn't that so, Miss Richards? Go ahead, tell him, Millie. You're so clever. You're the greatest actress in the world. You had everything worked out to the smallest detail. Be quiet, you fool. 
They can't prove a thing. No jury in the world would believe them. I'm too great an actor to be convicted of murder. Do you hear? I'll give a performance that'll sweep a jury off its feet. They'll never forgive me. They'll never convict me. And that is the story. As it is written in the sealed book of how an actress tried to impersonate death and failed. Millie Richards had one more opportunity to act upon the witness stand at her trial. But again, she failed. For the jury found her and her brother Gerald guilty and sentenced them to life imprisonment. Strange are the secrets of the human heart and the ways of fate in trapping men and women in their own evil schemes. Keeper of the book, before you close the great volume, show us the tale we tell next time. This one, yes, a weird and amazing story of a wife who loved her husband too fondly, and of another wife who came from the grave. A tale titled, Till Death Doeth Part. Be sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting tale from The Sealed Book. The Sealed Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. As you know, I've been working to lose weight for a while, but I love bread, which is pretty much 100% carbs. One slice of wheat bread is about 12 carbs. That's 24 carbs if you're making a sandwich, and that's just the bread before you put anything into the sandwich. But I saw an ad online for Hero Bread that claimed zero carbs. I was skeptical. I tried other zero-carb breads in the past that were absolutely horrid. But I clicked and ordered a loaf of their seed bread and their white bread. Not only did it feel and taste like actual bread, I've gone back to making sandwiches like I did before my low-carb diet. I can have a grilled cheese without worry. I make many pizzas by toasting the white bread and using it like pizza crust. So I went back and found that Hero Bread also has hot dog buns, so I jumped on that. Again, zero carbs. They have zero-carb hamburger buns, dinner rolls, tortillas, and more, even croissants. I asked them if I could please work with them, and they said yes. So now you can get Hero Bread by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. And if you create a subscription, you can even save 10% on everything you order. If low-carb is your life right now, try Hero. WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. Makers of Fleischmann's Fresh Yeast present I Love a Mystery. 
Love a Mystery, presenting the latest adventures of the three comrades, Jack, Doc, and Reggie, now engaged in launching the A-1 Detective Agency, just around the corner off Hollywood Boulevard and one flight up. Say, listen, Dresser, I know it's your job to get people to drink Fleischmann's yeast, and I know it's good for them if they need more vitamin B complex. But that's just the point. Why all this hullabaloo about vitamins anyway? Our ancestors seem to have gotten along pretty well without vitamins. Well, that's where you're wrong, Dick. Our ancestors got their vitamins from the food they ate. Well, why can't we? We do, but our modern methods of preserving, refining, and cooking foods are likely to result in the loss of certain priceless vitamins. So it becomes advisable to fortify our diet with some vitamins, especially the important vitamin B complex. And since it's known that the natural vitamin B complex is definitely unattainable in any mixture of the synthetic factors now known, you'll find many people drinking Fleischmann yeast. You see, you get the entire natural vitamin B complex in yeast. Well, that makes sense. But how does yeast taste? Well, people tell us that when you mix Fleischmann yeast in cool milk, water, or tomato juice, that it tastes just like oven-fresh bread. But here, see for yourself. Fleischmann's fresh yeast in tomato juice. Drink it, America. Your help. Eight Kinds of Murder, a new Carlton Morse adventure thriller. o'clock in the afternoon in the super colossal old stone pile of a mansion, wherein the ancient and filthy rich A.B. Cooper Mitchell resides with his newest and most voluptuous wife, the fan dancer, Nevada Cole. Jack, Doc, and Reggie have just arrived at the Cooper Mitchell mansion for a last word with the septuagenarian multimillionaire before an all-out attempt to capture Mr. Purdy in his, his dilapidated old apartment house out near the beach. Mr. Purdy warned that anyone approaching the ramshackle apartment house would be blasted into oblivion via the sawed-off shotgun road. But Jack, Doc, and Reggie have determined to chance it, as Mr. Purdy is a killer and his next declared victim is Nevada Cole. You see, Mr. Purdy is actually the son of Cooper Mitchell by an earlier marriage to a circus tightrope performer. Mitchell has not even heard of this son or his acrobatic mother since the child was eight months old. And now he comes back a man and a ruthless killer to do away with everyone who stands between himself and his father's millions. Already he has killed Doug Loftus and Judy White and Ava Blue and Satin Mitchell, each one dead by one of the methods named on his list of eight kinds of murder. And now Nevada Cole is next. That's why Jack insisted on stopping at the Mitchell residence to warn Nevada once more to remain locked indoors. That's what he's telling old A.B. Above everything else, Mr. Mitchell, keep Nevada safely locked in this house until we got Purdy behind bars. That's easier said than done, Mr. Packard. What do you mean by that? And Nevada Cole has a mind of her own, I'm afraid. Well, hasn't the little fool sense enough to know when she's in danger? Impetuous, Mr. Packard, impetuous. Uh, where is she now? Uh, in her suite in the West Wing, I should imagine. I know where it is, Jack. Okay, Reggie, go get her. Hey, uh, how about me going? No. Okay, okay. Go along, Reggie. You're quite. Uh, she won't appreciate the interruption, I'm afraid. Interruption? Yes, this is the hour she spends before her great mirrors practicing her fan dance. Practicing her fan dancing in front of a looking light? <laughs> yes, I've seen her. Just let me go help, Reggie. Doc, will you relax? Relax with little old Nevada Cole doing a fan dance this very minute, maybe less than a hundred feet from where I'm standing yes, at? Yes, relax. On you asking for more than human flesh can stand. Look, if we can get off the subject of Nevada Cole and our fans for a minute, we... Hey, Don, where's that boy Huey? Huh? Well, he come in with us. He was here just a minute ago. Didn't I tell you not to let him out of your sight? Oh, he's probably just wandering around somewhere. Didn't I tell you the boy was in danger? Danger? Yes, danger. 
Why do you think we've been keeping him right with us since his mother was killed? Hey, I, I didn't think it was that serious. Well, it is. Nonsense. What danger could the lad be in in this house? Plenty. Somebody mentioned my name? Hey, Hugh. Hey, Hugh. Where have you been? Oh, just out around the halls. Well, you ain't supposed to do that, fella. No? Why not? Look, you saw your mother murdered with your own eyes. Yes. You saw her fall four stories almost at your feet. What are you trying to do? Drive me crazy. I'm trying to drive some sense into your head. If Purdy felt it was necessary to kill your mother, he'll want to kill you for the same reason. I'm not afraid of Mr. Purdy. Oh, don't be such a blasted little fool. Well, I'm not. Yeah, it was only last night you come sobbing into the A-1 agency begging us to save you from Mr. Purdy. Well, he's not in this house, is he? We don't know whether he is or not. Jack, you mean that maybe he you, is? What are you saying, man? Mr. Purdy in this house? Why not? There's some kind of evil loose in this place. Evil? Evil? Yes, evil. Let me stop here to warn Nevada on our way to Purdy's Beach Place. Maybe we'll... Uh, Jack, what you talking about, sir? You've been here as long as I am. Yeah, but nothing... You have to wait. Wait for what? I imagine Huey here or Mr. Mitchell could tell you. How about it, Huey? I... I don't know what you're talking about. Get down there. No. You brought me here, didn't you? I just arrived when you did, didn't I? What can I know about what's going on in this house? You managed to give us the slip for a few minutes, didn't you? I wasn't trying to give you the slip. No? No. I just wasn't interested in your conversation, so I wandered out in the hall. Uh, maybe. What about you, Mitchell? Hey, what's that? I said, what about you? What about me? There's murder in this house. Murder? It's written as plain as day everywhere. Murder. I have been guilty of no murder in this house or any place else. Well, it's here. I don't believe you. Well, then you're just crazy in the head. Jack smells murder like most folks smell roses. If Jack says Jack. it is... Jack, look what I have here. Hey, here come Reggie. He's got Nevada. He's carrying Nevada coal. Hey, Reggie, what's the matter? Here, let me put it down. Nevada, Nevada. Well, is she dead, son? No, no, not yet. But examine her, Jack. Hurry. She may have been bitten by a snake. A snake? Here, yeah, let me see. Doc... I'll get my kit out of the car. A black bag? Yeah, hurry. You bet you. Nevada, not you too. Makes you think she was bitten by a snake, Reggie. Well, I went to her suite and rapped on the door. There wasn't any answer. I tried the door and it was unlocked, so I opened it. Uh, oh, you found something? She has been bitten? Go on, go on. You open the door. Right. There she was lying in a heap on the floor beneath her ostrich fence. Nevada. You'd better sit down, Nevada. Mr. Mitchell. Yes, Reggie. Well, I, I rushed over and lifted the fans and... There was a snake. What? Quite. A snake coiled on her abdomen. A snake was coiled on her stomach. Hey, quit swaying. You gonna faint on us? No, I, I'm just a little dizzy. Yeah. Come to a chair, Reggie. Yeah, quite. There you are. How about you, Mr. Mitchell? I, I'm all right. Uh, you killed the snake, Reggie? Yes. The moment I lifted the fan, the thing hissed at me, struck at the fan, and then slid off her abdomen and into a corner where I finished it in a hurry. Then I slipped her into this negligee and brought her here. Uh-huh. There's no sign of fang marks. The redness is slowing. Yeah. Help me turn her on her face. Right. She isn't likely to have been bitten on her back, I wouldn't think. Mm. Uh, don't let her get her face down the pillow there and smother. Right. I'm, I'm watching. Okay, Jack. Here's a little black bag. Okay. Open it up and get out that file of brandy. Yes, ma'am. For who? Not for you. But, Jack, they don't give liquor to folks for snake bites no more. Rather hasn't been bitten. She ain't. Thank him. Well, if she ain't been bit, then what is the matter with her? Probably saw the snake and fainted. Well, just faint, huh? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I say, she's coming around. Here. Turn her over on her back again. Yeah, right up. Got that brandy ready, Doc? Yeah, I'll say. There she is. Oh, no. Get away. Take it away. It's all right, now. Take it easy. It's a snake. A snake. Whoop. Help me to hold her down, Reggie. Easy. That's a girl. Here, Nevada. Drink this. Open your mouth. That's it. Drink it all. There. The snake. Oh, kill it. Kill it. Hey, hey kill fella, it. what you trying to do? Climb my frame? Oh, I didn't know where I was. You're safe and sound. And nothing's the matter with you except you just had a bad dream. Oh, the heck I did. That's all. Just a bad dream. Bad dream, my eye. Somebody turned a snake loose in my room. Oh, hiya, Pop. Nevada. Nevada. Are you all right? Yeah. yeah all right, Pop. Mr. Purdy almost got me that time. He's a, a wicked, wicked man. Even if he is your son. Uh, Pop, I denounce him. I deny him. He takes after his mother's people. Oh, that snake. 
Hey. Oof. Hey, Jack. Yeah. Look at Huey. Trying to sneak out on us. Get him and bring him back. Come on, Reggie. We'll get him out in the hall. Right on. Where you think you're going to, son? Let go of me. Ain't trying to sneak out on us, are you? It's none of your business. Oh, now you oughtn't to talk that way to me. Let go of me! Uh, hey! Get him, Reggie! Get him right through! Uh, you know, when you take your hands off me! Oh. I say, uh, pull him off! Ouch! He bit me to the bone! Hang on till I get him by the collar! All right, right, now then. Get up on your feet. Let go of my collar. Come on, stand on your feet. Push me. But you know that folks that don't get pushed over chairs sometimes get the next bus in? You're choking me. Well, then quit acting like a cross between a bus saw and a barbed wire fence and stand still. I say... Will you look at my wrist? Use teeth. Slash the flesh to the bone. Sure, ain't you ashamed? No, I'm glad. And look at this thumb. Hmm. Chewed to a gristle, looks like. And feels like it. You're liable to get hydrophobia getting bit by a poisonous insect like Huey here. You better get Jack to put some stuff on it. Yeah, I think I will. Can you bring Huey back in? Can I bring Huey back in? I just wished he'd try not to come along quiet. I will. I will. Right -o. I'll go ahead. Take your hand off my collar. Not a chance, son. Come on now. Come on, Marge. <laughs> Now, now that my mother's dead, I, I haven't got anyone. Son, how can you expect to have anybody feel sorry for you the way you act? I, I can't help oh, it. Oh, of course you can help it. For instance, why did you want to go trying to sneak out on us when our back was turned full? I, I just wanted to be alone. Yeah, maybe. Okay, right in here with everybody else now. Oh, here they are. Yeah, here's little Huey, the wild boy from Borneo. He tried to chew Reggie up and spit him out. Chew? Check that germicide stings like filio. Yeah, I'll stop in a minute. Oh, Al, yeah, Nevada. Setting up, huh? Yeah, I'm all right. But I'm still looking for the rat who turned that snake loose in my room. Mm, looks like Mr. Purdy's in the neighborhood. Well, he may be tough. But if I ever get my hands on that goon, I'm going to tear off an arm and beat him to death with it. Nevada's such language. Sure, Pop. A bit gruesome, but it'd teach him a lesson he wouldn't forget. Hey, Jack. What you want me to do with the boy wonder here? Stand him up against the wall. Stand him up against the wall? No. Stand him against the wall. No, no. Come on, son. You heard what Jack said. Let me go. Stop it. Take his other arm, no. Reggie. Right -o. I don't want to be here. I can't stand being held down. Send his shoulders to the wall. Right. All right. Back him up. No, no, no. Come on, son. Now stand up and take him. Come on, get back. There he is, Jack. <laughs> I don't want to interfere, and maybe you boys know what you're doing. I assure you, we do. Yeah, sure, but three of you picking on a kid. Ain't that pretty rough? You make them let me go, Nevada. Oh, so now you want to hide behind a woman's skirt, huh? I don't get it. You will in a minute. Reach down, unbutton his coat, Reggie. Quite. Right. No, no, no. Hold him, will you, Doc? Yeah, yeah. I got him. I say, what's this? Hey, yeah. two inches in diameter, facing around. Now reach in his coat pocket, Doc. Yeah, uh huh. Picking on me. Huh? It's nothing but a heavy pair of leather gloves. Yeah. Gloves that he put on when he took the poisonous snake out of that rubber tube around his waist and let it go in Nevada's room. Huey. Huey, you didn't. Don't believe them, Nevada. They're trying to frame Huey, me. Huey Carver, how could you do this to me? How could you turn that horrible, filthy thing loose on me? How could you, Huey? How could you? That was easy for you. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Should have been after what you did this morning. After what he did this morning? Yeah. After pushing his own mother out of the hotel window four stories up. Jack, <laughs> Huey pushed that and Mitchell out of the window? Yep. And then picked her up and brought her to us, crying and pretending that somebody else done it? That's it. Yeah, but Satin said Mr. Purdy did it. To cover up for Huey. To cover up for her son. Nevada, please. Huey Carver, <laughs> you're the lowest, filthiest, slimiest thing in this whole ugly world. And I mean that. You see, you see, nobody cares about... <laughs> But if Huey killed Satin Mitchell and tried to kill Nevada, then who killed Judy White and Doug Loftus and Ava Blue? And where does Mr. Purdy fit into the murderous scheme of things? In just a moment, new violence enters the picture. But first... Say, you know, I really enjoyed that glass of Fleischmann's yeast and tomato juice you gave me a while ago. I think maybe I'll start drinking yeast regularly. Well, fine. Yeah, but suppose I decided against taking yeast and I was not getting enough of the vitamins it supplies. What had happened? Oh, when we don't get enough of such vitamins in our diet, nothing sudden is apt to happen. We are likely to begin feeling below par, easily fatigued, nervous, mentally depressed, 
have poor appetite and feel just generally run down. Hey, what do you mean, begin feeling that way? That's exactly the way I've been feeling for months. How did you say you mixed that yeast and tomato juice? I'm starting tonight. Well, you won't regret it if it's more of the vitamin B complex you need. These vitamins are required for normal vitality, a buoyant sense of well-being. Now, here's all you do. Just mash up a cake of Fleischmann's yeast in a dry glass with a fork till it's thoroughly broken up. Add just a little cool milk, water, or tomato juice. Stir till smoothly blended. Fill the glass, give it another stir, and here you are, Fleischmann's Fresh Yeast in Tomato Juice. Drink it, America. To your health. Well, Huey, that makes you just about the lowest thing on two feet. <laughs> Let me alone. But, Jack, I don't understand. How did you know it was Huey? I'll explain all that later. What about it, Huey? You want to say anything for yourself before we turn you over to the police? I couldn't help it. I had to do it. A bad boy. A bad, bad boy. Hold it, Pop. You had to kill your mother? Yes. You had to turn that snake loose in Nevada's room? Yes, I had to. And you had to strangle Judy White? That cute little girl, Judy. You killed her, too? I didn't want to. It was so easy. But I didn't want to. Don't give me that old malarkey, Hugh Carver. If you didn't want to, why did you do it? I had to. He made me. Made you? Yes. He said he'd have me locked up in an institution where I couldn't get any more stuff. You, you an addict? Yes. Ah, should have known it. <laughs> should have spotted you right away. Oh, yeah, especially after running into that nest of snowbirds out of Mr. Purdy's apartment house. Didn't I always say, Hugh, he was a bad boy? You terrible, wicked, horrible old man! I say! Well, no, whoop, 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 hang on to him, Reggie. Yeah, I got him. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's better. Not just hold still. Jack, the sooner we turn this crybaby murder over to police, the better I'm going to like it. Yeah, I'm not through with them yet. He ain't, huh? No. Huey, and you're going to say that you were forced to kill because Purdy threatened to have you locked up in an institution for addicts if he didn't? Not Mr. Purdy. Not Mr. Purdy? No. It hasn't been Mr. Purdy any of the time. It's been... <laughs> no. No. Jack. Jack, you has been shot. Where'd those shots come from? I didn't see anything. Where's he hit at, Jack? He's dead weight hanging on us. Yeah. He's dead, period. I see. Shot through the heart. Lay him on the floor. Hey! Hey, come here, look at Pop! What's the matter with old Cooper Mitchell? It's a heart attack. It's the worst one he's ever had. Oh, go and look how red his face is. Yeah. Congestion. Got any of those heart pills or medicine? Yeah, yeah, he always keeps them in his vest pocket. Good. From the way the bullet entered Huey's heart, the killer must have been in the window just behind Mr. Mitchell. Yeah, and the smell of burnt powder stronger over here, too. Well, you guys might take the trouble to go out and see what you can find outside if you're not nailed to the floor. Hey, did you give Pop one of those pills? Yeah. Oh, he looks terrible, Jack. Yeah, I know. I think this is A.B. Cooper Mitchell's last heart attack. Oh, no. I'm afraid that... Look out. Uh-uh. There goes the spark of life and spirit out of a very tired old man. Yeah. Oh, Pop. No. Shall I cover him over, Jack? Yeah. Wait. Can't you I turn him a little and lay him out comfortable? Yeah, just, just a minute, Ray. All right. There. Hey. What's the matter? Look. Laying down here back of him. I say. A pistol. A doggone shooting pistol. Hey, dog, don't touch it. Let me pick it up with my handkerchief. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Still warm. Still warm? What does that mean? It means it looks like A.B. Cooper Mitchell himself shot little old Huey. I killed Huey? I don't believe it. Well, all I know is... Well, you said yourself somebody must have leaned in the window and shot Huey. Why couldn't he drop the gun on the lounge behind Pop when Pop keeled over? Well, I think we can soon answer that. Turn on that floor lamp and bring it over here, Reggie. Right, huh? Hey, was Mitchell right or left-handed? He was left-handed. Uh-huh. Then we'll examine his left hand. Where do you want the light, Jack? Right over his hand here. Yeah. Down close. That's it. Huh. Look. Little black specks embedded in his skin. Gunpowder. Hey, you... You mean Pop did kill Huey? No doubt of it. And the gun will probably show his fingerprints. Oh, but Why? Why would Pop want to do a thing like that? Because I think Huey was just about to tell the truth about him. The truth? What truth? Don't you remember I said, so Mr. Purdy was going to have you placed in an institution. And Huey said, not Mr. Purdy. It hasn't been Mr. Purdy any of the time. Hey, 
And Huey was just about to tell on old A.B. here, and A.B. had to shoot him, and in the excitement, the old boy's heart quit on him. Exactly. Yeah, but what? What was Huey going to tell? That Mitchell here made Huey kill Judy White, and his mother sat in Mitchell, and made the attempt to kill you with a poisonous snake. Golly, I... I wonder if... Hey, can I have that little gold key off Pop's watch chain? Why? It opens a little wall safe I've never seen the inside of. It's got stuff in it I'd like to know about. Where is this wall safe? In Pop's room. Okay. Here's the key. Reggie, you go with her. See, she doesn't hide or destroy anything. All right. Well, doggone, Jack. You think Huey killed Doug Loftus and Ava Blue... Hey, wait a minute. Huey couldn't have killed Ava Blue, and neither could old A.B. here. What's that? Why, sure. Don't you remember? Huey was up with us in the A-1 agency when when, uh, Ava was run down by that automobile down in front. That's right. And old A.B. was having a heart attack in the inner office. Sure he was. Little old Jerry Booker was nursemaiding him. So if Huey or A.B. didn't kill Ava... Hey, who's that? Probably the police. We expecting the police? Why not? There's been shooting. Somebody was bound to investigate. Well, don't stand there. Go let them in. Okay, okay. Well, hold your horses, will you? Hi, Doc. Hey, Jerry. Look what I got in tow. Mr. Purdy. Yeah, Mr. Purdy. He's had a gun in my back all the way over. Can we come in? Well, I guess so. Why did you come here? Never mind the gap. Shut the door. Uh, sure. Where's everybody? They're in here. And don't try nothing funny. Hmm. With a pistol pointing at me? Doc, what's the matter? Mr. Purdy, Jack. Mr. Purdy with a shooting pistol. Jerry, what are you doing here? Uh, Mr. Purdy came to the A-1 office and, and pulled a pistol on me. Said he'd shoot me if I didn't bring him to you folks quick. So here he is. Hey, what's the matter with Huey? Dead. Oh, yeah, and Coop, Cooper Mitchell? Dead, too. Yeah. Sit down, everybody. Sit down, huh? Yes, yeah, sit down. I want to talk. Golly, to... Reggie, can you teach her that? Don't none of you move. Wait till Jack hears about this. Talk about your double cross and old he Billy goats. That guy. Hey. Come in and sit down. I say, Mr. Purdy. You too. Well, right. Purdy. Yeah. This makes eight of us, including two corpses. You ain't planning to make no more corpses, are you, Mr. Purdy? No. And my name isn't Mr. Purdy. Hey! I see. Sure, I can talk just as decently as any of the rest of you. It's only as Purdy I talk like this. Well, if you're not Purdy, who are you? I'm I'm Benny Benjamin, character actor in the films. Not Purdy the gangster and killer and son of Cooper Mitchell? No, I'm an actor and a darn good one. How I ever got myself in this mess, I wish somebody would tell me. Of all the lousy ways of making money. You mean you ain't a dangerous character? No, I ain't a dangerous character. I'm Benny Benjamin, can't you hear? And how about putting up that gun? Well, it's not loaded. Look. And I've been dying a thousand deaths with an empty gun in my back. Sorry, but I had to find Packard in a hurry. Why? I just found out I was mixed up with trouble. I want to clear myself before the police catch on. Well, well, the floor is yours. Look, I've been practically starving to death here in Hollywood. A couple of months ago, a voice called me up and asked me if I'd do a private job for him as a gag. Offered me 500 bucks for a month's work. Cooper Mitchell? I didn't know it then, but it was. Said I was to take the name of Mr. Purdy and live in a dilapidated old apartment house out on the beach. Said I was to let on like I was a long-lost son of A.B. Cooper Mitchell. Yeah, what happened? Nothing happened. Except that I found out there were a lot of hopheads smoking marijuana in the basement. I told the voice... Old A.B.? Yeah, I told him about it, and he said not to worry. I wouldn't be bothered. He gave me another 500 to go on with the impersonation. Oh, uh, and then things did begin to happen? Yeah. First, Satin Mitchell came to see me with a story about her being the ex-wife of Mitchell and wanting my help to get the whole estate. What'd you do? Next time the voice called me, I told him about it. Looks like that's what he was waiting for. He told me exactly what to say to her and how to handle her. And the next thing was getting Huey, her son, out of jail. Yeah, we turned him in as a murder suspect. How do you get him out? I don't know. The voice told me just what to do, and I did it, and Huey was turned over to me. Well, old boy must have had some influence on her. Mitchell, or the voice as you know him by, told you to play along with Satin? Pretend to help her get his money? Yeah, it's all right here in his diary. Diary? Yeah, that's what Reggie and I found. This diary was in his wall safe. Mm, writing an autobiography, huh? Well, I don't know anything about that, but everything I did was on the voice's instruction. The night Huey got away and came to you folks, and I tried to get him back, and Doc Long there jumped me on the stairs. Well, I should have thought by this time you'd have realized all this wasn't just a gag. Mm-hmm. It was beginning to look pretty sinister, but I hadn't done anything I couldn't explain to the police, and I did need those $500 bills. Oh, well, what about that St. Valentine's Day massacre gag when you 
Line Doc and Jerry and me up against the wall. I didn't know what the payoff was. The voice told me to do it and that he'd come in and take over. But the waiter arrived first and you took a high dive out the window. Yeah. And that's when I began to think I'd better do some checking up. Things were getting too hot. Pointing guns at people and things and get a fellow in a lot of trouble. Boy and hell. Yeah. So I got to checking up on the people the voice had sent to me and I found a lot of them were dead. Doug Loftus, Judy White, Ava Blue, Satin Mitchell... All folks the voice had sent to me. And then I found out the voice was the millionaire A.B. Cooper Mitchell himself. You didn't suspect before? No. He'd mentioned Cooper Mitchell, but as someone else. I didn't catch on until I began to check up and found I was all mixed up in a murder scheme. Well, who killed Doug Loftus and Ava Blue? Mitchell, I guess. No, we know he didn't kill Ava Blue. It's in his diary here, Jack. Yeah? Yeah, listen. I had planned to kill Ava Blue and had slipped a list of eight kinds of murder in his pocket. I always saw my intended victim carried one of my murder lists. He was accidentally killed by a hit-run driver before I could act, while I was out with a heart attack in the A-1 office. What a perfect alibi for any murder I have committed, or may commit. Doggone. Pop, that's awful. Yeah, and you want to know why he was killing and making Huey kill? It's all right here. Listen, in every murder for inheritance, it's always the heirs who kill the rich relatives. Well, this time it's different. I detest everyone who is eligible to inherit my money, so I am determined there will not be one of them alive when I die. Not one. Since he was a lad in this house, I have given Huey Carver narcotics so he'd be under my control to use in this scheme of mine. He has been of great value. Great guy. What a brute. Yeah, poor Huey. Yeah, and that murder plot included me. Well, you did survive him to that. Yeah. I did, didn't I? Yeah, from fan dancer to multimillionaire in one afternoon. That's some jump. Maybe you can learn to do a dance with thousand-dollar bills instead of fans. My public. <laughs> <laughs> well, that just about takes care of the case of eight kinds of murder. Yeah. Now what are we going to do, Jack? What do you say to taking 13 weeks off and going fishing? Oh, fella, I hate fishing. Let's go where there's some female women. You're going fishing and like it. No women? No women. Ain't that awful, Reggie, for 13 weeks? No women. Now, just a word to good housewives. If you bake at home, use Fleischmann's Fresh Yeast, the household favorite of four generations. And if you want to add a good supply of vitamin B complex to your daily diet... Drink Fleischmann's Fresh Yeast twice every day. Yes, drink it, America. To your help. The eighth and final chapter of the adventures of the three comrades with eight kinds of murder is now complete. I Love a Mystery, written by Carlton E. Morse, is ringing down the curtain for the annual summer vacation. We wish to thank all those who have been with us during the past nine months, and we hope sincerely you will be with us again this fall. I Love a Mystery has come to you through the courtesy of the makers of Fleischmann's Fresh Yeast. Monday, June 30th. In the first half of 1941, millions have enjoyed richer, more delicious tea. Tender leaf brand tea made with young, tender tea leaves. In packages, two convenient sizes, or improved tea balls. Tell your grocer, Tender Leaf Tea. This is the National Broadcasting Company. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. What evil lurks in the hearts of men. <laughs> the shadow knows. Hello, 
Co. presents The Shadow, the mystery man who strikes terror in the very hearts of shopsters, lawbreakers, and criminals. Ladies and gentlemen, when you hear The Shadow's blood-curdling laugh, you can be sure that exciting entertainment will follow. And here's something else that you can be sure of. When you buy blue coal, you're getting the finest of Pennsylvania hard coal. The harmless blue coloring that identifies blue coal is your guarantee of clean, even, safe, dependable heat all winter long. So don't take chances. Insist on blue coal. Ask for it by name. Phone your order to your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. And be sure to hold on for John Barclay's important message at the end of this program. The plot murder announced for today has been postponed. Today, the circle of death. Oh, Jack, what a delightful show. What a wonderful way to start our honeymoon. Darling, when it comes to shows and girls, I'm a swell picker. Now watch me pick a nightclub. Oh, taxi. Hey, taxi. Darling, I think you're wonderful. I've never had such a marvelous time in my life. Hop in, honey. Things are pretty quiet around the theater district tonight, Bill. Yeah, pretty thin crowd. I don't blame folks for staying away. After those three bombings and 15 people being blown to pieces, I wouldn't be here myself if it wasn't the commissioner's orders. Same here. Boy, has this town got the jitters. Commissioner Weston's hopping around like a cat on a hot stove. I hear the Midtown Association is going to ask for his resignation if he don't catch the nut that's scattering bombs around here like confetti on New Year's Eve. The guy that's pulling these jobs sure must have it in for a lot of people. Yeah, he's a real screwball, if you ask me. Look at the way he's always sending warnings to the newspapers before he blows another batch of pedestrians to Hades. Yeah, and have you noticed? He always ends his notes by saying, I hate crowds. Yeah. Now, this is the time that crazy goof warned he'd set off another blast. Maybe his, his watch is slow. Things are going to pop if he pulls another job and kills any more people. Well, maybe... Maybe all the cops have them scared off. Maybe. Maybe not. Bill, look at that car. Blow the smithereens. Bastila strikes again. Five more dead. Get your paper here. Paper. Read all about the mad maniac later It's horrible, Lamont, horrible. It's senseless and insane, Margot. Crimes like this always are. Turn on the radio. It's time for a news bulletin. There's a switch from the dashboard. All right, Lamont. The attack upon the inefficiency of the police department. Tonight at Midtown Hall, a meeting of businessmen of the entertainment world and property owners is in progress. Police Commissioner Weston has been asked to defend his department and produce results or resign. Oh, that's enough, Margot. Washington, D.C. Now, listen carefully. Yes, sir, Mark. I want you to go to that protest meeting right over there at Midtown Hall. Commissioner Weston is speaking, and the crowd is pretty certain to heckle his explanation of the failure of his department to catch this fiend. I'm sure of it. Now, here's what I want you to do. Keep quiet and watch your chance. Then I want you to cry out that Shadow could solve this crime without half trying. Aren't you flattering yourself? Never mind that, Margot. I have a very definite reason for doing this. A lot depends on your getting the crowd to take up your suggestion. I'll do my best, Lamont. But where are you going? I won't be far away. Hand me that leather case on the floor. Here you are. Am I permitted enough womanly curiosity to ask what's in it? <laughs> Just a little wire-tapping device. Telephone? No. No, Commissioner Weston will be talking over the loudspeaker system in Midtown Hall. Don't be surprised if the shadow interrupts his speech. Now, remember, Margot, cry out at the psychological moment. Hundreds of lives depend on it. We don't want alibis, Commissioner! We want action, Weston! Crazy man's making a fool of you, Weston! Gentlemen! As I have explained to you, every available resource of the police department has been thrown into catching the seed. Our bomb squads have cold the city. Every known criminal with psychopathic tendencies has been rounded up and questioned. Not one fragment of a bomb has been found. No buildings have been damaged. No one person has been singled out for death. 
This is not an ordinary crime. We are not dealing with an ordinary criminal. Oh. Alibi! Alibi! We've had enough! Fifteen people dead! Fifty injured! You talk! Talk! Business is at a standstill! We're being ruined! The whole city's in a panic! Get this killer or resign! Why shouldn't we? Get out! Let the mayor report some of the praise and let the Texas made it! Before he strikes again! Yes. The shadow can solve this crime without half try! There's an idea! The shadow! Yes, yes. the shadow again! He cracked cases for you before, Weston! Why don't you call him in? He wouldn't have to do much to do a better job of it than the police have! Get the shadow, Weston! What about the commissioner? You've done nothing in two weeks! You're sick! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Hold on! What makes you think this man who calls himself the Shadow is interested in law and order? He's helped to crack plenty of criminals, hide me. Yes, he's tipped us off occasionally, but it may have been to get rid of rivals. We have no assurance he isn't a criminal himself. What of us? A thief can catch a thief. I don't run my department that way. You're not running it at all. That's a matter of no, opinion. You're not running it. I was asked here to tell you what we've been doing. You seem to think my department works with the Shadow. We don't. We never have. And as for the shadow and you, reporter, can spread it all over the front pages, I challenge him to uncover one single scrap of evidence that my men have overlooked. I challenge the shadow to find this maniac. I am the shadow. I accept that challenge, Commissioner Wetson. I am working on the case. Gentlemen of the press, it will not be necessary for you to print the commissioner's challenge, but you can print this challenge to the arch fiend behind this reign of terror. Print this, gentlemen. The shadow will trap the mass killer if he dares walk through the central arcade during the rush hour between five and six tomorrow night. Remember... The Central Arcade between five and six tomorrow night. I dare him to come to walk through the Central Arcade. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a paper. Give me a paper. Uh, two cents, mister. Uh, here's your two cents. Well, thanks. Here's the paper. No, no, no. Not that one on top. People, crowds have seen it. Well, so what? They're all the same. No, no, no. Give me that one underneath. Okay. The customer's always right. Hey, you mass murderer challenged by the shadow. Get your extra paper. <laughs> the Central Arcade tomorrow. Mm, so he's daring me, the shadow fellow. He knows I hate crowds. Crowds and people pushing and getting in my way. Voices talking and shouting. I hate them. I hate them. But I'll show them. I'll show the shadow fella, too. I'll fool all of them. I'll accept his challenge. I'll be there at the Central Arcade. And the shadow fella will know I was there. <laughs> the whole world will know. <laughs> After I'm gone... Orders have been carried out, Commissioner Weston. Good. There'd better not be any slip-ups. 200 patrolmen are stationed in the neighborhood of the Central Arcade. 50 picked men of the plainclothes and bomb squad will be in the crowd. If there is a crowd. There'll be a mob after all the publicity. If I could get my hands on the shadow, I'd wring his neck for this. Uh, what time is it? A little after four, sir. We'd better get down there pretty soon. Yes, sir. Shall I take that call, sir? No. I've been waiting for this. And if it's who I think it is... Hello. Hello. <laughs> listen to me, Shadow. No, Commissioner Weston. You listen to me. I'm listening. Wait, Connors, trace this call. Yes, sir. Don't bother, Commissioner. You can't trace this call. I tapped a line. Just as I tapped the Midtown loudspeaker system last night. Oh, that's how you pulled that crazy stunt. You're a fool, Shadow. Don't you realize you've endangered the lives of thousands of people? Nothing will happen if you do not interfere. I don't take my orders from you, Shadow. You're not running the police department. I'm not giving orders, but I need your help. 
Just do one thing for me, and you and not the shadow will get the credit for the capture of the mass killer. Oh, yes? Well, what do you want? Just keep the crowd moving through the narrow arcade. Just keep them moving. Keep them moving. Everything depends on that. What are you trying to do, Shadow? To find a needle in a haystack. A man in a million. You are having a chance. The maniac won't come. You overlook the fact that a dare is a powerful psychological magnet that no egotistical crazed mind can resist. Just keep that crowd moving, Commissioner. Keep them moving. <laughs> When you start figuring ways and means to save money for Christmas gifts, fuel is probably the last thing that comes to mind. Naturally, you don't want to jeopardize the health and comfort of your family. But did you know that you can actually have better heat for less money simply by burning blue coal? Here's why. Blue coal is a rich Pennsylvania anthracite. The fuel that furnaces, space heaters, and cooking ranges in this part of the country were especially designed to burn. And while other fuel prices are advancing, the cost of anthracite is not. No wonder thousands of homeowners are switching back to anthracite. No wonder anthracite is the fuel that is used for cooking purposes on the nation's cracked passenger trains. They have tested all kinds of fuel and found that anthracite is far more economical because it burns long, steadily, evenly, with minimum drafts and less attention. Now, the cream of all Pennsylvania anthracite is blue coal. It comes from the mines of the famous Glen Alden Coal Company. It's tested and retested for purity and uniform sizing. Blue coal is prepared especially for home use, and it comes in all domestic sizes, egg, stove, chestnut, and pea. So if you want clean, even, dependable heat at lowest cost, always order blue coal. Phone your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. You'll find his name listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the name Blue Coal. Time's almost up, Commissioner Weston. Yes. Two minutes to six. Oh, this is the longest hour I've ever spent in my life. Can you beat it the way people have flocked here on the chance of seeing somebody else blown to bits by this maniac? It looks like the shadow was right. The way they've been swarming through this arcade. Yeah, and watching each other like a bunch of wild animals. You see what happened to that poor guy with the Christmas box? I nearly killed him before we got him out. All he had was a doll for his kid. I saw it. Well, the time's up, Commissioner. Yes. Thank heavens. Any orders, sir? Just keep the men on duty till this crowd thins out. They'll be going home now. Commissioner! Commissioner Weston, look. What is it? The maniac. He's been here. Look at this piece of paper. Where'd you get it? In the arcade. He must have dropped it. What's it say, Commissioner? Tell that shadow fellow I'll kill me a lot more people at 11 o'clock tonight. Oh, I was afraid something had happened Something to has. I found the maniac. Thank heavens. Have you notified the police? Margot, this man is a fiend. If I notified the police and they bungle things, he might kill hundreds of people. This is a job that the shadow must handle alone. But Lamont, he's dangerous. You might fail. He might kill you. The shadow won't fail, Margot. But if he should, it's far better that one die than hundreds. Oh, Lamont, please. There must be a safer way. Perhaps, brand. Margot, but this is the only sure way to end the career of this mass killer. Oh. Goodbye, my dear. Lamont. Oh, Lamont. <laughs> Here comes a headquarters car. Yeah, it's Commissioner Weston's car. He's plenty worried about this maniac threatening to kill another batch of people at 11 tonight. Well, you sure have to go out of the theater area to kill him. They won't let anybody in the district here without a police permit. Wait a minute. Here comes a guy. Hey, you! 
You. Who, who, me? Yeah, you. Where do you think you're going? Me? I, I'm going to work. That's where I'm going. Got a permit? Got a badge. See? <laughs> Says I'm a night watchman. I got to go to work. What do you watch? Where do you work? <laughs> I watch things in the ground. Down there. Down where? D- down under the street. D- down under the planks. Oh, I get it, Bill. He's a night watchman down on the new subway they're building. Oh. Yes, yes, that's it. <laughs> I go down them steps. Every night I go down them steps and watch. Well, why did you say so? Get on with you. Get to your watching. Thank you. <laughs> Joe Tonetti is waiting for me so he can go home. Every night at 10.30, I take from him the job of watching. <laughs> now, that's a job I wouldn't want any part of. Me neither. I'll find my beat on the street. Uh, Oh, Joey. Joey Tanetti. Joey, you can go home now. I'm here to watch. Hey, what's the matter? You're half a big speakerback fella. You're a five minute late. I want to go home. Here's the keys to everything now. You watch out. Or don't you go to sleep? <laughs> the police don't want to let me come to work. But I show them the badge. <laughs> you can go home now, Joey. I'll, I'll watch everything. Okay. See you in the morning. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Oh, all those people. So many people always pushing. Pushing me. But I'll show them. I'll fix them good. I'll kill them. That shadow fellow, I'll show him too. <laughs> now, now, now I, I'm alone. <laughs> all alone. Not quite, Anton Spivak. You are not quite alone. I am with you. Huh? Do you hear my voice, Anton? Sure, sure. I, I always hear voices in the dark, on the street, and here under the street where I watch every night. Yes, Anton. But you've never heard my voice before, have you? Well, maybe. I, I, I don't think so. What's different about your voice? It's the voice of the shadow. Oh, <laughs> You're a pretty smart voice. <laughs> How'd you find me? Hey, where's that shadow fellow the newspapers talk about? I am more than just a voice, Anton Spivak. I am the shadow. You, you're the shadow? Yes. Where are you hiding? I am hiding under the cloak of invisibility. You cannot see me because I have clouded your mind. So you cannot see that which is here. How did you get down here in this subway excavation? I followed you down the steps. Hmm. How did you know where to find me? I picked you out of the crowd in the central arcade. (laughs) How did you know I was the one? Your eyes showed me. I knew then how much you hate crowds. My, My eyes show you? Yes. You passed close to me as I stood in the shadows. Hmm? The arcade is narrow. You didn't see me. Hmm. No one saw me. But I saw you. How'd you find out my name? I followed you to the place where you live. I found out you work here. In the tunnels. Oh, then then, then, then you, you followed me here from my home tonight? Yes, Anton Spivak. All the way. Mm, good, good. <laughs> You're a very clever shadow. But, but but you must go now and let me do my work. My work. I, I, I ain't got much time. Now, now go quick before I get mad. You know, you're plenty smart. <laughs> I, I'm glad to know you, Mr. Shadow, but, but no, 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 you have to go. Yes, I'm smart. But you're smarter. <laughs> you bet. Let me stay. I want to learn. You can teach me things. Then maybe we can work together. You hate people too? Yes. I hate crowds. Let me watch you and learn. All right. I'll let you watch. What are you going to do? (laughs) You just watch. What's in this shed? You see? Dynamite. Sticks and sticks of dynamite. Is this what you use to kill people with? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> My precious dynamite. 
They kill the crowds I hate, see? <laughs> now, look here. Here's a stick of dynamite already fused. There's one, two, three, four, five, and six. Six sticks of dynamite to go with it. <laughs> now, you watch. See, Shadow, I, I tie them in a bundle. But how do you take that dynamite to the place where you killed all those people? It's a block <laughs> away. How do you carry it? <laughs> that, that's where I'm smarter than you, Mr. Shadow. Show me. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> now, look, look, see, it, it's almost 11 o'clock. Here, here. You, you see this little hook? I, I hook the dynamite to it. Then what, Anton? Wait, wait. You, you, you hear that car overhead on the boards? Yes. Well, if, if the light is red, it will stop right over our heads. Now, now listen. There, there, you see? The light is red. Now, now I take this crowbar. I go up this ladder. Come on, come on, you come with me. Yes, I am still here. Although you cannot see me. Now, now you watch. I, I pry the end of this plank back, see? And I, I, I hook the dynamite on the brake rods. I strike a match. And, and I light the fuse. And, and, when, and when, when, when the light changes, the car takes the dynamite with it. And when the dynamite explodes a block away, I'm still here. While the... Oh, no, 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 no. You, you put out the fuse. You've tricked me. And here is the dynamite. No. Oh, he took it off the car. It, it's gone without the dynamite. And I promised I'd kill a lot of people tonight. Now I have to wait. Tomorrow the crowds will be still pushing me. Scaring me. You tricked me. That's what you did. You you tricked me. Where are you, Shadow? Shadow. Come here, Shadow. Nice, Shadow. Nice, Shadow. I'm here, Anton Spivak. Yes, yes, I I hear you. <laughs> nice, Shadow. Come, come close to me. Put down that dynamite, Anton. No, no, Shadow. I light another match. If you touch that match to the fuse, you'll die too. But I'll kill you, and I don't care. You wouldn't let me kill people, and I don't want to live. I want to die. I want you to die too, Shadow. Wait, Anton. Oh, no, 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 you blow out my match. Yes, I have a plan. Those thousands of people waiting up the street. Huh? Yes? You can kill all those people. Wouldn't that be better than just killing the two of us? <laughs> how, how, how? Tell me Take how. Take your dynamite and come with me. Up the steps. Up to the street. Oh, no, 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 no. no, no there, there, there's policemen out there. I saw them. But they won't see you. Any more than you can see me. No, 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 no. They will see me. Hypnotize them. Huh? Hypnotize them. Look straight at them. Stare at them. And then they won't be able to see you. No, no, no. I'm afraid. Think of all those people waiting to be killed. Come. Just a few more steps. I am with you. You'll be safe. I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> All those people waiting to be killed. <laughs> I'll try it. But, but don't you leave me, Shadow, or I'll light the fuse. I'm here, Anton Spivak. Look. There are the two policemen. Uh-huh. Just. Stare at them hard as you pass, hmm. and they won't see you. All right, I'll, I'll try, I'll try. Well, it's past seven, Connors. <laughs> Looks like a false alarm this time. Hey, wait a minute. Here's that night watchman. Hey, what's the matter with him? What's he staring at? Look. Look what he's carrying. You can't see me. You can't see me. Dynamite. Grab him. No, no. Take it away from me. Let me go. Hold it. No, I said no. I got him. It's a mask killer. No, no. Oh, he, he lied. He fooled me. He said you couldn't see me. No, no, no. Give me my dynamite. I want to kill all those people. Hold him. No. Here's Commissioner Westall. I got him. We got him. 
We've got the maniac, no, Chief. Don't go out here. Let me look at him. No, no, no. He, he, he tricked me. He, he said you couldn't see me. Where'd he come from? About a subway excavation, Commissioner. He's a night watchman. No, no. no he, he tricked me. The, the shadow tricked me. Oh. It was the shadow. Yes, Commissioner Weston. The shadow. I found the killer... But the glory is all yours. <laughs> Before we tell you of the Shadow's next exciting adventure, here's John Barclay, Blue Coal's famous heating expert, with an important message I promised you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Barclay. Friends, there are just two more days left in November. That means that homeowners have only two more days in which to phone their blue coal dealers and get the full details on how they may have a blue coal heat regulator installed in their homes for a free trial period of two weeks. To me, this is the most unusual offer ever made. The free use of a blue coal heat regulator for two whole weeks without any obligation on your part to buy. Believe me, friends, until you've used one of these marvelous thermostats, you don't know what real comfort is. Imagine having your home warm and cozy from morning till night without once having to make a trip down to the furnace. And that's not all. You'll find you burn far less coal with this regulator, too. But don't take my word for it. See for yourself. Phone your blue coal dealer tomorrow. I thank you. Friends, for your own sake, do as Mr. Barclay suggests. Phone your blue coal dealer tomorrow and get full details of this amazing free trial offer. Prove to yourself what thousands of satisfied owners already know... That with a blue coal heat regulator, you get more uniform heat, more economical heat than the most expensive oil burner can give you. But don't wait. Phone your blue coal dealer tomorrow. The story you have just heard is copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. The characters in this story are entirely fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. the makers of G. Washington's Coffee bring you a story from the Sherlock Holmes series of mystery dramas. This week's adventure is an adaptation of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story entitled The Final Problem. Remember as you listen to it that G. Washington solves your daily coffee problem just as surely as Holmes solves his famous mystery. At the end of the program, we have a brief announcement about Dr. Watson and his friend Sherlock Holmes. Please listen for it. And that opening paragraph is always leads us to Dr. Watson's comfortable, hospitable study. Well, there's a blazing fire and a steaming cup of G. Washington coffee to welcome you. Here it is, Mr. Bell, made it as you came up the steps. Thank you, Dr. Watson. 
You know, a good cup of coffee always seems to me to be the very essence of hospitality. You name me a better coffee than G. Washington's, Mr. Doug. Go ahead, name me one. Ah, <laughs> oh, but seriously, G. Washington's isn't just another brand of coffee. It's really entirely different. It not only has a perfect flavor, but it's the easiest coffee to fix. Just a teaspoonful in the cup, add hot water, and incidentally, you never make more than you're going to use, so that makes it economical, too. Right, Mr. Doug. I suppose I begin my story. Fine. What's it to be this time? How about another tussle between Holmes and Professor Mariato? Excellent. Always oh, gives me plenty of first-class shudders to meet that individual. Well, tonight's story deals with Holmes' efforts to break up one of his most unpleasant schemes. A uh, racket, you call it, today. And did he succeed? Oh, now, Mr. Bell, that's putting the cart before the horse. <laughs> the affair began <clears throat> with a series of curious disappearances from St. Anthony's Hospital. Well, what disappeared, Dr. Watson? People or things? They were corpses, or perhaps I should say cadavers. Oh, no, before I go any farther, perhaps I should explain that St. Anthony's is a medical school and hospital combined. I myself took my course in anatomy and dissection inside its venerable walls. Sir Lionel Drakelake, the head of the staff, was an old friend of mine. We cursed our internship in the same hospital. Well, to make a long story short, I, I received a frantic communication from Sir Lionel begging me to persuade Holmes to come straight to the hospital. I remember that night perfectly. A particularly nasty pea super had settled down over London. Literally feeling our way, we crept along the embankment till we sensed, rather than saw, the grey walls of St. Anthony's looming up ahead. <laughs> Hoghorns always have to sound so mournful. Well, Watson, you would insist on coming tonight. Well, the staff entrance should be somewhere along here. And here it is. I stumbled over the doorstep. Where is that infernal bell? Oh, here we are. I hope the night watchman hasn't gone off in his rounds. No, no, someone's opening the door. Mr. Watson, uh, the call back. Can't see very clearly. It's me right enough, Leo. I brought Sherlock Holmes along with me. Oh, thank heavens. Come in, come in. Uh, Holmes, this is my old friend, Lionel Berkeley. Ah, the very honored, and I may say grateful and relieved that this is the sixth theft inside the month, Mr. Holmes. It's got the place in an uproar. Nurses have hysterics. Patients insist on going home. I take it you're alluding to the cadavers which have been stolen recently. Yes, Mr. Holmes, you know how jealous a hospital is of its reputation. At least it will better the scandal. Oh, and... cheer up, Leo. Oh, maybe it's just a prank of one of the lads. You know what medical students are. Yeah, that's what I thought when we found the first body missing four weeks ago. But now that five have been stolen, oh, no, that's carrying a joke too far. They tried to get away with another this evening. Really? I just happened to drop into the dissecting room and time to stop it. The minute I opened the door, I knew someone was in there, but... He slipped out the side way before I could light the gas. Well, but uh, come and see for yourself. Follow me. The, the laboratory is in this way. Oh, Morton Leon. Mr. Amelia Leon. Remember when we used to sneak a forbidden smoke behind that broom closet? I wish to heaven life were a simple nowadays. Juice it faces like a beehive, buzzing with suspicion. No wonder we've been able to keep it out of the paper. Ah, uh, here we are. One second till I unlock the door. Uh, yes. Now, uh, just let me turn up the gas. Yeah. Well, there we are. Uh, quite impressive. I see you have all the latest improvements. Well, uh, that gentleman in the corner. I take it he was the object of tonight's attempt at the dust. Yes, Mr. Holmes, that's the corpse. Splendid specimen, too. Face mm. a bit the worst for wear. Uh, otherwise, a splendid body. Yes, yes, we were most anxious not to lose it. Mm, must be fairly recent. I see there have been no injections of the preserving fluid. I fact, Mr. Holmes, he died only this afternoon. And mm. yeah, the other stolen bodies, they have been duly preserved, I suppose. Well, uh, no, now to mention it, they 
They were all stolen before being treated. Curious, eh, Watson? Well, I don't know. I suppose if you're going to be a body snatcher, you might as well take fresh ones. Uh, you'll pardon me if I rummage around a bit, Sir Lionel? Of course, of course. Yes, I, I can carry out my interrogations and my investigations at the same time. My, my name is Lee Politics. Hmm. Uh, now then, uh, male or female? What? The stolen bodies with a male or female? Oh, uh, male, all of them. Nothing. Hey, interesting, eh, Watson? You mean you think the thief's a woman, Hank? Well, I wouldn't go so far as that. Uh, what age are the missing corpses? Oh, I don't know. Middling, I should say. Remarkably good lot of bodies, though. No mark to take them in. Uh, here's the land. has been careless about killing a gentleman. Oh, that'll be Potter. Has some girl on his mind. Can't wait to get washed up and away. Okay. And, uh, and you found this, uh, this specimen out here after the thief was scared off. Huh? I take it the cadavers aren't usually left lying about. Oh, certainly not. They're kept in that long steel cabinet over there. Can't be too careful, you know. Have to be rats in the building as old as this. And, uh, uh, how many people have keys to that cabinet, Sir Lionel? Well, only Dr. Lacey. Well, you may know him by reputation, Mr. Holmes. And you go, Lacey. He's our head surgeon and has charge of the classes in the city. Of course, brilliant fellow. I say, Leo, how's he coming along with his experiments in transplanting tissue? I can't say. Carries on most of his experiments in a little laboratory he's fixed up in his own lodging. He never lets anything out till it's perfect. One of the cleverest surgeons in the country, Mr. Holmes, magnificent touch. I could wish, however, that he was a better professor. No, no good at teaching, eh? Well, it isn't that. It's his temper. He can be devilish nasty. And let him catch one of the lads with an instrument bent out of place. Oh, it's a phobia with him, Mr. Holmes. A place for everything and everything in its place. <laughs> Just young Potter says he seems to write before ladies see them. Oh, this is the door through which the thief escaped, I take it. Yes, and I, I bolted it on the inside, as you can see. Yeah, that's that. I think I've seen all there is to see. Found anything, Holmes? Yes, yes. There's what you might call an overabundance of clues. Too many to permit of any intelligent deduction. Oh, what do you mean? Well, there are 14 sets of fingerprints, for instance. In the dust, under that operating table alone, I found shreds of five different types of tobacco. Well, he ever played Mrs. Sutton getting careless again. Oh, she's the cleaning woman, Mr. Holmes. And Dr. Lacey is always complaining that she's inefficient. Well, Mr. Holmes, if you finished your investigation, perhaps you can advise us how we should act in this matter. Well, before I do that, suppose we come to an understanding. Would you be satisfied merely to stop the theft, or do you want to know who is responsible for the missing corpses? We must find out everything, Mr. Holmes. Who and what and how and why. A mystery of any kind is most demoralizing for a hospital. Well, in that case, we should do nothing further. Oh, we should do nothing further tonight. But aren't you going to, uh, to set a watch on this? We did. The criminal wouldn't show up. You may take my word, Mr. Lionel. The man who has been stealing your cadavers is thoroughly acquainted with the workings of this hospital. Look here, Mr. Holmes. But if we don't set a guard on this room, he may steal this body, too. I sincerely hope so. Well, no use making things too easy for him. At least we can put the body back in the cabinet. Unfortunately, that won't be possible. We can't open it. The cabinet has a string lock. The thief slammed it after him. Oh, dear, dear. What will Lacey say when he finds this corpse out here in the morning? Oh, I don't think there's much danger of that, Sir Lionel. Really, Mr. Holmes, I am disappointed. I you must say I hope you will be more helpful. Hmm. Well, there's one thing we can do for you before we leave, eh, Watson? No, Watson. Well, we can make up for Mrs. Tut's deficiencies. Uh, if you'll get us a couple of old rags, Sir Lionel, I think Watson and I can go over this room in no time. Oh, You've gone out there, man. Not at all, my dear Watson. Not at all. It's most important that everything should be neat and tidy. Oh, All the fog. But what's the idea of routing a chap out of his nice warm bed in the street still deserted? Too depressing, if you ask me. The important thing, my dear Watson, is in setting a trap is to collect your catch before anyone else does. No. Oh, yes, St. Anthony. Hello, hello. Sir so Lionel seems to be having a bit of an argument with someone on the set. And I don't think we'll all be scared by any two of any sexes. You see, I'm going home now to fix Dr. Lacey's breakfast, but I'll be back. And when I do, I'm going to clean that room. Oh, but Mrs. Cut, I assure you I'll that... find one you ought to be put in charge. Everyone knows routine is what keeps an officer to running. Uh, uh, oh, what, Mr. Hope? I didn't see you. Mr. Cullen. What's the matter? You come if you want, I'd like to know. How can we wait, you? What? Here, yeah, I uh, beg your pardon. I'm not to be put off the schedule. I'll take it back to my... Yes, uh, that's... Uh... That was Mrs. Clark. Uh, so I gathered. A bit of a 
termagant, and the old red hair. Well, come in, come in. <coughs> Sorry to give you such a stormy welcome, but I, I just caught Mrs. Clough about to clean up the laboratory. <laughs> I suppose you want to take another look at the place. It's it convenient, isn't it? Of course, of course. Follow me. Oh, I, um, I wonder why the sudden burst of energy on Mrs. Sudbar. Well, Dr. Lacey may have been putting the screws on. <laughs> they get along like cat and dog, those two. But didn't I just hear her say that she was going home to fix him his breakfast? Yes. You see, Dr. Lacey is Mrs. Cut's car lodger. But surely if they get on each other's nerves as they seem to... Yes, it is a bit difficult to understand, I admit, but... Oh, I suppose Lacey hesitates to move. He's, he's really very comfortable. and He's built in a lot of improvements, cupboards and things of that sort. And I've told you how he is. A place for everything and everything in its place. Moreover, Mrs. Cutts is a first-class cook, and Lacey, of course, he's a good feeder. Well, but Lacey, I wouldn't push the old girl too far. I'd be afraid of finding poison in the coffee some bright morning. Well, here's your lemon, Mr. Holmes. Up to you, gentlemen. <laughs> Looks about the same as he did last night. I shall be able to judge better after I've gone over the place with my microscope. You said yourself there were too many fingerprints and things. Well, why do you suppose I insisted on those rags last night, eh? Huh? No, of course not. Indeed. Oh, they're rubbing out those prints. Oh, marvelous, my dear Watson, marvelous. The old brain is actually functioning this early in the morning. Now, now, let's see what we bagged. Hmm. Oh, here, here. Here's the sleeping stroke of a mop. The very mop that has been standing in this corner. Here. Here, yes, yes. Here are the imprints of a heavy hand on the edge of this table. Note the unusual walls on the left-hand middle finger. Like a question mark. And those must be Mrs. Custer's fingerprints. She was just about to start dusting the table when I caught her. Yes, the prints on the mouth and on the table are identical. Well, well, well. Well, that seems to be all the evidence against Mrs. Clutch. I got her out as quickly as I could. Holmes, I suppose. The corpse is gone. Well, I wonder how soon you notice that. The corpse has been stolen. But uh, what did you expect? Huh? <laughs> Sorry to contradict you, Mr. Holmes, but uh, the corpse has been put back in the cabinet. Oh, and then? Yes. Uh, matter of fact, it slipped my mind. I should have mentioned it sooner. Seems Dr. Lacey dropped in late last night and insisted on putting the cadaver back in the cabinet. Nothing the night watchman could say to persuade him. And I told you about his mania for order last night, Mr. Holmes. Ah, uh, these are doubtless his fingerprints, then, here on the lock and around this panel of the cabinet. Ah, uh, yes, typical surgeon's hand. Long, sensitive fingers, but strong. Tips slightly specialist. Yes, that's Lacey right enough. But, Holmes, aren't you going to look inside the cabinet? Oh, I suppose we might as well, if Sir Lionel can provide us with the key. Oh, certainly, certainly. Uh, Lacey left his bit tonight, watch from there. Uh, here we are. Why, Joe, the corpse is missing. Yes, I gathered it might be. Well, now, now let's see if we can find anything further in the room itself. Ah, here we are, here we are. Print of the third set of fingers. Yes, yes, yes. He came in here earlier than Lacey. And notice the fingerprints of the door now. First this individual, then Lacey, and finally, Mrs. Clutch. All nicely superimposed, one over the other. See, Holmes, this is fascinating, almost as exciting as a scientific experiment. Yes, yes, this third individual had not any two settings. Ah, here, here he stumbled and had to put his hand out to break himself. There's a nice print here on the wall. Mm. He moved over to this jar of alcohol. He removes the cover, then he puts it back again. And here, here he staggers out. You mean he was intoxicated? Beautifully, beautifully. Yes, but I don't understand. Why thunder did he come poking around, round here in the middle of the night? Well, what, have you no recollection of your own green cellar days? Did you ever sneak a bit of uh, laboratory's alcohol to help out a celebration that had suddenly gone dry? Uh, what of the students, eh? Any idea of which one is the home? Well, I think I can make a guess, but I don't intend to. The boy isn't mixed up in this body snatching. The corpse was here when he left. His prints are under laces on the doorknob. What is it, Potter? Oh, I, I just thought I'd slip in and uh, polish up uh, my instruments before the picture. I, I, I do the uh, Before Dr. Lacey gets in the captain. Uh, I'll come back later. Well, not all, not all. Come right in, come right in. We're just leaving. Yes, but Holmes, we haven't discovered anything. Oh, but we have, what we have. We know for sure that either Lacey or Mrs. Clutch is involved in this business. Possibly both. Yes, yes, sir. I suggest we go to pay the Clutch Menage a visit. Well, I'll be glad to take you over myself. What are you uh, You look a bit fagged this morning. Uh, I'm all right, sir. A little liverish, that's all. Well, don't let it get you down. Come along, Watson. Oh, uh, Miss Potter. Yes, sir. So, uh, they tell me tomato juice is an excellent antidote for raw alcohol. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
That's uh, Mrs. Cutts' plate over there. The, the house with the white shutters. Now look at that crowd of people standing gawking out in front. I say, looks like something's happened. Yes, yes. There's my favorite watchdog of the law, Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard, standing in the doorway looking important. <laughs> oh, hello. Hello, Lestrade. Uh, what's up, eh? Uh, plenty. A woman by the name of Klutz has just murdered her lodger, Dr. Lacey. Well, I told you she'd do it someday. Mm, any unusual details? No, open and shut case. First, she stabs him with a kitchen knife, then she throws the body, clothes and all, into a vat of nitric acid that's close to Stephen in his dressing room. Indeed. Any objections if I come in and take a look around? Mm, all right. But I tell you, this case is open and shut. But come in, come in. Body's in first room, head of the stairs. It's not nice, but if you want to look, go ahead. I got to stay here. Oh, thanks, thanks. It's a vile odor. Yeah. Chemical smell plus something else. Oh, that'll be the acid. Look out, look out. Stay at the dark. Wait, wait. You hear that noise? Like something bubbling and fine? Yes, yes. That's the acid that's working on the body. Caught. That smell is acid and fat dissolving. <laughs> Quack. <laughs> that's the wrong. Oh, good morning, Jenkins. Jenkins, good morning. The squad said you here to guard the body, eh? Yes, sir. <coughs> this air. Oh, Jenkins, Jenkins, I think you might yeah. open another window. Get a draft through here. Yes, sir. Now, Watson, uh, if you'll bring me that jug labeled olive oil, you may as well stop the action of this acid. You're right. Yes, sir. Pour it right into the tub. Hmm. As the squad said, the remains are not exactly attractive. I wonder, Sir Lionel, if you could uh, bring yourself to... Uh, to identify, Dr. Lacey. Well, certainly, Mr. Holmes, I'm a medical man. I'm quite used to... Uh... Yeah, yes, it, it, it's rather horrible. Tastes almost entirely eaten away. Mm, with the dark hair, what was left of it, and the clothes and that ring, he never could get it off his little finger. Yes, yes, I think we may safely say that it's Lacey, for the whole. Well, Jenkins, how was he killed? Kitchen knife on the table there. Mrs. Clute's fingerprints plain as day. <laughs> So the squad has been persuaded the, the value of fingerprints, eh? Dear, 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 the world does progress. Yes, yes, yes. These are Mrs. Clutch's prints, all right? Hello, Joe. Hello, dear. Bring Mr. Clutch along. Why didn't you go and take your dirty hands off me? I didn't kill him. He was dead when I come in. He was dead when I came in. Johnny, you'll live and get going. Uh, just a moment. I'd like to ask this uh, this lady a few questions. He was dead when I found him. Is it likely I had to call in the police if I did, Johnny? Oh, you called in the police. Well, that she did. Leaning out the window, screaming bloody murder. So any idea who could have killed Dr. Lacey, Mrs. Burke? No, sir. I think we know all night. On account of my sister's having a baby, I went straight from her place to the hospital. Well, had a chance to check up on that, Mr. Burke? Oh, that's straight enough. But she'd been home at least 20 minutes before she called the police. Time to murder half a dozen doctors. I didn't do it, Mr. Burke. You know, Lestrade, it's just possible that Mrs. Clutch may be right. Huh? You see, it would take several hours for acid to dissolve the corpse as far as this. What all of it? Her fingerprints are on the knife? That's enough for me. Hers and no one else. And why shouldn't me fingerprints be on that knife? It's me own kitchen knife, ain't it? Well, then I, I suppose you look at it again. Now, what in blaze is good? Now, notice the order of the fingerprints, for instance. Thumb and forefinger near the blade end of the handle. Now, uh, suppose suppose you take this pocket knife of mine and uh, and pretend to stab me with it. Now, obviously, it's just a lot of... All right. There, now, you see? Notice the way you hold it? Thumb against the outer end, little finger next to the blade. In other words, the grip for using a knife for kitchen work and for stabbing are exactly reversed. Dr. Lacey was not stabbed with this knife at all. It was put here by someone to incriminate Mrs. Clutch. Yes, but if she didn't do it, who did? Someone who wanted to get rid of her. You any idea who that could have been, Mrs. Clutch? No, sir. That I haven't. The only person mean enough to do a thing like this is that son of a gun, Lacey. And he's dead now, Lord rest his soul. Oh, dearie me, it's not bad enough having a murder in my own house and then losing my best lodger. But the police have to go accusing me on top of it all. Not as not, I'll never get another tenant of these rooms. Oh, dearie me. Well, all that is so much fraud, my dear Mrs. Scott, compared to the real danger you're in. What's that? The murderer. He's still at large. And he isn't exactly fond of you. I think I'll just drop in from time to time to make sure you haven't been murdered in your bed. <laughs> Mrs. Clutch is in danger. Obviously, oh, Watson. Obviously, confounded. Why didn't she answer the bell? If anything happened? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, there she comes. Oh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Please 
step inside, I'd have come to the door sooner, but I was upstairs cleaning out Dr. Lacey's suite. Would you believe it? I've got a tennis You don't say, you don't say. Well, does he know it's his friend? Yes, so that he does, but he says he's not superstitious. Well, how fortunate. What's he like? Well, he's a German. Professor or something. Come here to carry on some experimenting with Dr. Lacey. Dr. Lacey told me he was expecting him only last week. And so when he come asking for Lacey this morning, and I told him what had happened, right away he asked if Dr. Lacey's notes and instruments were still here. And when I said yes, he said he'd move right in and carry on with Lacey there at all. Would you mind coming upstairs while I finish my work? Well, either way, Mrs. Butler, either way. He's a nice-looking man, too. Blonde with a beard. He limps a little. Oh, it'll be a relief, I tell you, after that, Lacey. He was getting queerer and queerer going out at all hours of the night. I declare I was on the verge of telling the police to keep an eye on him more than once. Well, here we are. Just you sat on the sofa. Now, what in the name of... Well, from what I can see out of the window, I should say that your new lodger has arrived. Thanks, preserve us. Excuse me, gentlemen, when I let him leave. Holmes, doesn't mean we'd better be going. In a moment, Watson, in a moment. Tell your time. This way, please. Look up at the tenement there. Oh, why, ain't he talking? Oh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Holmes, Holmes. Uh, this is Herb Glover. Uh, Professor Glover, Glover. 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 How are you doing? Delighted. Sorry I had come all this way and then find a friend dead. Ah, uh, he is no friend. He is what you call a uh, uh, colleague. Uh, Mrs. Glover, the poor man who on the bed, please. Yes, well, I know Mrs. Potts will make her comfortable. I uh, trust you had better luck than Dr. Uh, and, uh, uh, come, Watson, come, come. We must be going. You see, Professor Glockpeter, uh, we were the uh, the detectives on this case. Don't you have found? Nothing, I'm afraid, nothing. Hmm. Well, these are my notes on the case. I'm really rather ashamed of them. Uh, would you mind if I uh, if I burn them here in your fireplace? Oh, not at all. Thank you, thank you. Oh, dear me, dear me, dear me. I don't seem to have a bag. Uh, one moment, I'll get you some feet here in the drawer of this table. Ah, here you are, a nice little box. Thank you, Dr. Lacey. Huh? I thought you would know where to find them. A place for everything and everything in its place. Yes, I was sure you would be drawn back to these rooms. Me? You think I am Dr. Lacey? He is dead, murdered. No, that wasn't Dr. Lacey in that tub of acid. It was one of the bodies he had stolen from St. Anthony's. He had a rather curious confirmation of the bones of the right foot. I had seen it the night before, so of course I recognized it. Your misfortune, Dr. Lacey. Bodies, foot, sir, but it's all this rubbish. Well, you see, it came to my attention not long ago that Professor Moriarty was getting in touch with quite a number of heavily insured businessmen. One after another, these men died. But by and by, the insurance companies became suspicious. I was told to investigate. I discovered that on several occasions, Professor Moriarty had called on Dr. Lacey. Dr. Lacey, who was experimenting with facial surgery. Dr. Lacey, who had access to any number of corpses from St. Anthony's. And in time, I began to suspect that Dr. Lacey was working on these dead bodies and transforming them so they would look like the gentlemen who wished to collect their insurance. Hmm. Professor Moriarty made a handsome profit, I believe. Unfortunately, though, I, I couldn't prove my theory. Gosh, it is crazy. No one would believe it. Oh, so I found. Ah, they were good just to do you. Just this. When you're in prison, the whole scheme will fall to the ground. I am not Dr. Lacey. You have no proof. There you are wrong, sir. This little matchbox which you just handed me contains all the proof that I need. On it is a set of fingerprints, which is identical with some on the cabinet door in the laboratory of St. Anthony's. And those fingerprints are known to be Dr. Lacey. Oh, it's magnificent. Oh, element. Nominal. Elemental, my dear Watson. Elemental. That's the end of the story, Mr. Bell. But Dr. Watson, didn't the man ever confess? He did better than that. He offered to show up Moriarty. But when they came to take down his testimony... He was found dead on his prison cot. Obviously, more of Moriarty's work. And there's one thing I don't understand. Why didn't he take the same way out as the businessman? Surely he could have doctored some corpse up so it looked like himself. He could have, Mr. Bell, but that's where human nature comes in. He hated Mrs. Clutch, so he wanted to implicate her. It was his big mistake. <laughs> well, that certainly is a fascinating story, Dr. Watson. Now... Now to get back to something where there are never any mistakes. Well, I know what you're hinting at now. Another cup of tea, Washington coffee. Yes, indeed. Dr. Watson, have you ever stopped to consider how much the word economy has come to mean to Americans during the last couple of years? It's come to mean more to me, too. I have to save on a lot of things I never thought about before. How do you do it, Dr. Watson? Does it mean giving up all the good things in life and using cheaper quality? Not at all, Mr. Bell. I still keep to the good things, but I'm a little more careful how I use them. More satisfaction in being a little careful with good things, you know, than in putting up with poor quality. Oh, by the way. <laughs> what is it, Dr. Watson? You're, you're chuckling over something now. It's only fair to tell what it is. 
Well, a, a lot of people have been taking a lesson from Sherlock Holmes, Mr. Bell. They've, they've been drawing deductions. About what? About my book and Sherlock Holmes stories, Mr. Bell. They've been observant enough to notice the little number one on the back of the volume. And they want to know if there are going to be other books with more stories in them later on. I'm afraid I'm not very observant, Dr. Watson. I never noticed that little one. And are there going to be more stories? I can't tell for sure, Mr. Bell. I've been talking it over with Mr. Washington. It's just in case there are, I want everybody to get volume one right away. So they won't be left when the first edition runs out and be unable to make up their complete set. That's right, too. We'll have to warn them about that. Especially for that economy we were talking about. It's worthwhile getting a really good book for nothing. But what about G. Washington? Is that economy? Well, of course it is. You know Sherlock Holmes' story about the rich old mustard manufacturer, aren't you? I well, know, Dr. Watson. We can't say that I do. Well, it's a good story. It applies to saving money on coffee, too. It seems a smart young man, who thought he was smart anyway, asked the mustard king if he really made all his money out of the little bit of mustard people used on their food. And what did he say? He said no. He made most of it out of the mustard people leave on their plates. And that's just the way it is with coffee, or ordinary coffee. Anyway. You mean the real expense is not what you drink, but what you waste. Exactly, and that's where G. Washington saves. There's no waste. You only make what you want, and yet you can have all you want. Well, that sounds like economy, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Watson and I want you to test G. Washington economy. Get a four-ounce can right away. Don't be afraid of the size of the can or the price. G. Washington is economical because it ends weight. And as a special inducement, why, Dr. Watson will give you one of his books and seven Sherlock Holmes stories. Just print your name and address on the back of a label from your four-ounce can and send it to Morristown, New Jersey. You will receive, without cost, a handsome deduced book with a gold profile of Holmes on the cover and a picture of Dr. Watson as a front of two. In that way, you'll have the satisfaction of proving to yourself that G. Washington won't wreck your family budget and of getting a handsome book of Sherlock Holmes stories for nothing. Please note down the address, Morristown, New Jersey. And send in that four-ounce can label right away so you won't be left without volume one if the good doctor persuades Mr. Washington to wish in volume two. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week's story? Next week, I'm going to tell you the story of a man 20 years older than his bride and how death came to Rose Hill. Now, in answer to numerous requests, we want to announce that the Sherlock Holmes program has been on the air for three years. The part of Sherlock Holmes is played by Richard Gordon, that of Dr. Watson by Lee Lovell. Neither Mr. Gordon nor Mr. Lovell play the part of a detective and his doctor friend in any other program. There is a knock at the door late at night. You answer it to find two small children standing there. You're suddenly filled with an inexplicable fear. Let us in, they say. We need to use the phone. It's at that point the fear turns to utter dread as you see that these kids have completely black eyes. The Black Eyed Kids is an exploration of this terrifying phenomenon using true stories of encounters with black-eyed kids submitted to the My Haunted Life 2 website. G. Michael Vasey examines the evidence and investigates the terrifying black-eyed kids phenomenon, coming to some startling and shocking conclusions. Are they demonic soul-eaters responsible for the disappearance of some of the 90,000 Americans missing at any point in time? Or is this just another urban legend? another boogeyman designed to keep you awake at night. Listen to the book and find out. The Black Eyed Kids by G. Michael Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. A 
just a moment, sleep no more. But first... Here's the way NBC Radio cooks up a dish you're sure to enjoy. First, we take Eddie Howard and his orchestra, add songs by Dick Hames, and then blend with the music of Tex Beneke. We spice with comedy, sprinkle with games and contests, and stir with jack-of-all-trades master of ceremonies, Burt Parks. And lo and behold, we have an NBC bandstand, a refreshing dish of entertainment that really gives you a lift in the morning. And the NBC bandstand won't add an inch to your waist. And now, stay tuned for Sleep No More on NBC. This is Nelson Olmstead. Sleep no more. Sleep no more. Turn down the lights. Sink back in your chair and don't look into the shadows. In the shadows, there may be moving things. Tonight... It may be you will sleep no more. Good evening. This is Ben Grauer introducing tonight's tale of terror, told by Nelson Armstead on the National Broadcasting Company's presentation of Sleep No More. The story of terror can be as simple as a sheeted ghost rattling chains. It can be a complex and hidden world of horror, lurking in such unholy dimensions as only the dead and the moonstruck can glimpse. Or it can be those terrible, fathomless shadows which lie buried deep in the primitive mind of civilized man. And for this evening, well, Nelson Olmstead, tell us about this evening's story. Thank you, Ben. We have two stories tonight, and the first of these is by a favorite author of mine, a citizen of Roanoke, Virginia, by the name of Nelson S. Bond. Every time I think of this story, I'm reminded of a certain limerick which goes, The other night upon the stair, I saw a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. How I wish he'd go away. And that might very well serve as the theme of the first story. It's called... Mr. Mergenthwerker's Loblies. The faint tap on the door of my office gave me a chance to get my feet off the desk before I shouted, Come in! The door swung open hesitantly and I saw him. Yeah, I said. He stood there blinking at me apologetically. Tiny man, hardly more than five foot one, maybe two with sand-colored hair and eyes. His clothing was plain but neat, and he was nervous, and he said, Are are you the man who takes the news? Who? Me? Oh, certainly. I'm the whole darn newspaper. I write the front page, lay out the ads, draw the cartoons, dig up the dirt, and sell the papers on the street. What do you want, anyway? Why, I... Well, I, I just wanted to tell you there's going to be a murder this afternoon. Well, nice going, Mr. Uh... Mergenswerker. Henry... Mergenswerker. Nice going, Mr. Mergenswerker. You socked it right in the button that time. There is going to be a nice little murder this afternoon. A classic case with all the trimmings. I'm just writing the headlines now. D.A. slays maiden. Oh, no. Not the district attorney. Nothing like that. It's a girl up in the Bronx, a secretary named Hazel Johnson. She's going to be killed with a hammer. What's the gag? You know the girl? Me? No. Never saw her in my life. Then how do you know about the murder? They told me. He uh, gestured vaguely toward the door with one hand. Uh, they? Who? My loblies. The big one's name is Chapeth. The, the little one's named after me. They tell me everything. Now, wait a minute, buddy. Are you trying to tell me there's somebody in this room besides you and me? Oh, don't tell me you can't see them. So few people can. It's all because they will change color. If only they'd stay put, but no, they're forever... Listen, Mr. Watsitz, I got things to do, but worrying about your DTs isn't one of them. Now, scram! I pushed him, indignantly protesting, through the door. 
It wasn't ten minutes later the boss shoved open his door and let out a blat to high heaven. Holy Godshaw! Get McGuire and light out for the Bronx! There's a hammer killing up there! A gal named Johnson! Hazel Johnson! The funny part about it was there was no mystery connected with this hammer job. They caught the guilty man an hour after they found the body, and he confessed right off the bat. What I mean is, there wasn't one thing to connect my weird visitor with the case. So the affair bothered me. I looked up the name Mergenthorker in the telephone book and the city directory, but it wasn't in either one of them. I don't know just what I would have done if it had been. After all, you can't go to the Bobbies and say... Uh, look here, a guy named Mergenthorker has two green familiars who told him there were going to be a murder. So, I puzzled over the thing for a week or so, and then it gradually dropped out of my mind and might never have occurred to me again if I hadn't dropped into Tony's joint one night for a drink. Now, the back room is a dimly lit little hole with only about four tables, and as I entered, I saw this Mergenthorker sitting at the best table with a beer glass before him. The places on his left and right had beer glasses, too, but no one was sitting there. The sandy little man looked up as I entered. Oh, hello. Won't you join us? Oh, not there. Oh, you sit on Henry. I uh, took the chair across from him. It's so dark in here, I guess you didn't see Henry, did you? No, no, I didn't. Listen, buddy, I've been looking for you. How did you know about that Johnson murder? My, my lovelies, my lovelies told me. Henry here and... And Japheth. Yes, certainly. They tell me all sorts of things. For instance, did you know the Second National is going to be robbed on Tuesday? The uh, Second National? Yes. Four men in a blue car will hold it up at 3.30 p.m. Only the police will catch them. They're going to smash up the car trying to escape. Oh, got all the details, haven't you? I always have all the details. I had all the details before, but you... Well, it doesn't matter. Will you call Tony, please? Japheth wants more beer. I gulped and stared at Japheth's glass. Or maybe I stared first and then gulped. The glass was empty. And I would swear on a stack of proof sheets that I'd been watching Mr. Mergenth worker every instant since I'd come in, and he hadn't drunk that beer himself. Uh, say, does he, uh, does he drink very much beer? Oh, barrels. Both he and Henry. But what can I do? If I don't buy it for them, they make scenes. Uh, scenes? Yes, you, you know, pinch people on on buses and whisper things to girls, and especially pretty girls and young girls. Oh, Henry's the worst. He just doesn't seem to care what he says to young girls. Bergen, Thorker, either you're off your trolley or I am. You call uh, Japheth and Henry lovelies. Now, what do you mean by that? Why... That's what they are, of course. But how or where did you get them? I've always had them. Ever since... Oh, since I was very young. Japheth came first, but he was lonely, so after a while, the little one came too. We named him Henry, after me. Of course, he was very young when he came, and he had some perfectly awful habits at first, but he's starting to get over them now. Habits? Uh, what kind of habits? Oh, lovely habits, Things like Pudgeton and Rick and Trooks and... Hmm? Uh, what's that? Oh, well, Japheth says you wouldn't understand. Do you mind? Uh, not at all, no. Say, uh, Mergenthorker, I've got to run along now, but I wish you'd drop in at our office again someday soon and bring, uh, bring the lobbies with you. Thank you. I will. I rose from the table, reaching for my hat. Oh, uh... Japheth and Henry say, thank you for the beer. I glanced at the table swiftly, and once more, the beer glasses were empty. At three o'clock the next afternoon, I hoped up a phony excuse to plant two of the boys and a cameraman in the Second National Bank. At 3.30 on the dot, a blue sedan drew up, four men stepped out, whisked briskly into the bank covered the joint with a Tommy gun, scooped up the gravy, and moved along. At 3.57, their car, closely followed by my three men and the police, clipped an elevated post on 6th. And at 4.10, my sheet pulled the first beat this burg had seen in the past six years, a complete pictorial account of the second national robbery. 
I had just finished receiving the boss's congratulations, without a bonus, of course, when Mergenthorker came in. He was beaming delightedly. So, he said triumphantly. So, I agreed slowly. You were right. I don't know how or why, but you were. Oh, it's my lovelies. They know everything. Man, with Japheth and Henry to help you, you, you could be the richest guy this side of Hades. Do, do they know the result of horse races and lotteries and football games? I, well, I suppose so. I, I never, I never stopped to think. Why, well, my goodness, I could, could not. Well, it looks as if. Here, won't you and the boys sit down? Oh, no. Oh, my. But I never even thought of using Henry and Japheth to. Oh, will you come across the street and have a drink with us and talk it over? Well, why not? I said. When we reached the street, he grabbed my arm and helped me back. Let them go ahead, he whispered. Perhaps they wouldn't exactly like it if they knew I was planning to put, to use them like that. I'll have to break it sort of gently and see what they think. I wouldn't want to... Uh, uh, well, no, Henry! Henry! Suddenly he left me and darted into the middle of the street in front of a huge truck, arms out thrust before him as though to push some slighter body out of danger. A horn growled, brakes squealed viciously, somewhere a big whistle shrilled, and the pattering of many voices tightened into a murmuring knot in the center of the street. Numbed with fear, I elbowed my way through the crowd. Mergenthorker, his body grotesquely twisted, lay crumpled on the asphalt. I leaned over him and lifted his head in my arm. His eyes flooded open and he recognized me. Henry... Is, is he all right? Ah, ah, there. He said that so. Then he is safe. Now, you just take it easy, guy. There'll be an ambulance here directly. For me? Oh, no. I can't die. Jake, Henry, what will they do without me? My lovelies. My lovely, beautiful lovelies. Nobody to talk with. Nobody to buy them beer. And Henry is so young. Listen, they'll be all right. Now, I'll take care of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, said Mr. Mergenthorker. This has been Nelson S. Bond's short story, Mr. Mergenthorker's Lobblies, as told by Nelson Olmsted. And now, sir, what's the second of tonight's stories? It's something of a paradox, Ben. A chilling story of a heat wave. During the dog days of summer, have you ever thought what heat could do to your mind if you are nervous and excitable? This second story concerns two men who found the hot, oppressive, humid weather charged with mystery and weird prophecy. This is W.F. Harvey's remarkable narrative, August Heat. Fenestone Road, Clapham, August 14th. My name is James Clarence Withencroft. I'm 40 years old, in perfect health, never having known a day's illness. By profession, I'm an artist. This morning, after breakfast, it was oppressively hot. And I'd just made up my mind that the coolest and most comfortable place in the neighborhood would be the deep end of the public swimming bath when the idea came and I began to draw. The final result for a hurried sketch was I felt sure the best thing I had done. It showed a criminal in the dock immediately after the judge had pronounced sentence. The man in the picture was fat, enormously fat. I rolled up my sketch and, without quite knowing why, placed it in my pocket. And then, with a rare sense of happiness which the knowledge of a good thing well done gives, I left the house. I believe that I set out with the idea of calling upon Trenton, for I remember walking along Lytton Street and turning to the right along Gilchrist Road at the bottom of the hill where the men were at work in the new tram lines. From there onwards, I have only the vaguest recollections of where I went. The one thing of which I was fully conscious was the awful heat that came up from the dusty asphalt pavement as an almost palpable wave. I longed for the thunder promised by the great banks of copper-colored cloud that hung low over the western sky. I must have walked five or six miles when a small boy roused me from my reverie by asking the time. It was 20 minutes to 7. When he left me, I uh, began to take stock of my bearings. I found myself standing before a gate that led into a yard bordered by a strip of thirsty earth. 
where there were flowers, purple stock and scarlet geraniums. Above the entrance was a board with the inscription, Charles Atkinson, Monumental Mason, Worker in English and Italian Marbles. From the yard itself came a cheery whistle and the noise of hammer blows and the cold sound of steel meeting stone. A sudden impulse made me enter. A man was busy at work in a slab of curiously vain marble. He looked up as he heard my steps and stopped short. What? Why, it was the man I had been drawing, whose portrait lay in my pocket. He sat there, huge and elephantine, the sweat pouring from his scalp, which he wiped with a red silk handkerchief. But though the face was the same, the expression was absolutely different. He greeted me, smiling, as if we were old friends, and he shook my hand. I apologized for my intrusion, and I said, Everything is hot and glary outside. Uh, this seems like an oasis in the wilderness. And he replied, well, well, I don't know about the oasis, but it certainly is hot. Oh, it blazes. Uh, take a seat, sir. And he pointed to the end of the gravestone in which he was at work. And I sat down and I said, uh, That's a, a beautiful piece of stone you've got hold of. And he shook his head. Now... In a way, it is. Well, the surface here is as fine as anything you could wish, but there's a big flaw at the back there. I don't expect you'd ever notice it. Yeah. I could never make a really good job of a bit of marble like that. It would be all right in the summer like this. Wouldn't mind the blasted heat. But wait till the winter comes. <laughs> there's nothing quite like the frost to find out the weak points in stone. Well, then, what's it for? Well, you'd hardly believe me. If I was to tell you, it's for an exhibition. But it's the truth. Artists have exhibitions. Said to grouses and butchers. We have them, too. All the lightest little things and headstones, you ought to say. He resumed his work. We went on to talk of marbles and which sort best withstood wind and rain and which were easiest to work, and then of his garden and of a new sort of carnation he'd bought. At the end of every minute, he would drop his tools, wipe a shining head, and curse the heat. I said little, for I felt uneasy. There was something unnatural, uncanny meeting this man. I tried at first to persuade myself that I had seen him before, that his face, unknown to me, had found a place in some out-of-the-way corner of my memory. But I knew I was practicing little more than a plausible piece of self-deception. Mr. Atkinson finished his work, spat on the ground, and got up with a sigh of relief. Uh, well, now what do you think of that? he said with an air of evident pride. The inscription, which I read for the first time, was this. Sacred to the memory of James Clarence Withencroft, born January 18th, 1902. He passed away very suddenly on August 14th, 1942. In the midst of life, we are in death. For some time I sat in silence, and then a cold shudder ran down my spine, and I asked him where he'd seen that name. Oh, I didn't say it anywhere. I I wanted some name, and I put down the first one that came to my head. Uh, why do you want to know? It's a strange coincidence, but the name happens to be mine. And the dates? Well, I can only answer for my birth date, and that's correct. But according to your stone, I will die today, August the 14th. Now, what about that? Well, well, it's a rum go. But he obviously knew less than I did. I told him of my morning's work. I took the sketch from my pocket and showed it to him. He looked at the picture of himself being sentenced in court. And then he said, Oh, and it was only the day before yesterday that I told Maria there was no such things as ghosts. Well, neither of us had seen a ghost, but I knew what he meant. You have probably heard my name, I said. And you must have seen me somewhere and have forgotten it. Were you at Clacton on sea last July? I had never been to Clacton in my life. We were silent for some time. We were both looking at the same thing. The two dates in the gravestone... And one was right. We uh, resumed our conversation at the point we'd left off. You uh, must excuse my asking, I said. But since my picture of you shows you being sentenced in court, do you know of anything you've done for which you could be put on trial? And he shook his head. 
Well, I'm, I'm not bankrupt. Business is prosperous enough. Oh, well, three years ago, I bribed the grave digger with a tucky at Christmas. But that's all I can think of. He got up, fetched the can from the porch, and began to water the flowers. Twice the day, regular in hot weather. And then the heat sometimes gets the better of the delicate ones. And ferns, good Lord, they'd never stand it. I'll say, where do you live? I told him my address. It would take an hour's quick walk to get there. And I said, why? Well, now it's like this. We'll look at the matter straight. If you go home tonight, you take your chance of accidents. A cart may run over you. There's always banana skins and orange peels to say nothing of fallen ladders. Now, now, the best thing we can do is for you to stay here till it's 12 o'clock. We'll go upstairs and smoke. It may be cooler inside. To my surprise, I agreed. We are sitting in a long, low room beneath the eaves. Atkinson has sent his wife to bed. He himself is busy sharpening some tools at a little oil stone, smoking one of my cigars the while. The air seems charged with thunder. I'm writing this at a shaky table before the open window. The leg is cracked, and Atkinson, who seems a handy man with his tools, is going to mend it as soon as he's finished putting an edge in his chisel. It's after 11 now. I shall be gone in less than an hour. But the heat is stifling. It, it's enough to send a man mad. Signed, James Clarence Withencroft. Well, there we are, Atkinson. I've written down all that's happened to us in this strange day. Have you finished with your chisel? I, well, I say, Atkinson, what's the matter, man? You're as pale as a ghost. Atkinson... What are you doing? Wake up, man. Atkinson. 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 What have you done? You can turn up the lights now. You can look around you. Nobody is there, really. Everything is all right, isn't it? Step over here, Nelson Armstead, and tell us about next week's story. Next week, Ben, we again have two stories. This time, both are by the same author, Michael Fessier. They are called Over the Hill and The Man in the Black Hat. I know you'll enjoy them. You've been listening to Sleep No More, an NBC Radio Network production directed by Kenneth McGregor. Mr. Armstead's albums are recorded exclusively for Vanguard Records. Until next week, when Nelson Armstead will again be here in person, this is Ben Grower bidding you all good night. So far on my low-carb journey, I've lost over 50 pounds. Everybody's different, but it appears slashing the number of carbs I consume has had the biggest impact for me. 
and discovering Built Bars has made the journey a lot easier by replacing my high-carb, high-sugar desserts with something that still tastes like a candy bar, but only has 150 calories, is low-carb, and is packed with protein. If I'm craving a late-night snack, instead of heading to the fridge or pantry for something I know isn't good for me, I just grab a Built Bar. I've used Built Bars as breakfast on a fairly regular basis, which not only keeps me from the unhealthy fast food, but means I also don't waste money on those fast food places either. If low-carb is your life, try Built Bars. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness, all one word, and get 10% off your entire purchase. WeirdDarkness.com slash Built, promo code WeirdDarkness. Johnny, what's happened to New York? I'm not with you, Lee. Well, we've been here two weeks. Two whole weeks. And no crime has come our way. I seem to remember statistics to the effect that uh, a major crime is committed in New York every 75 seconds. Well, they certainly haven't been coming our way. Well, for my money, it makes a nice change. You know what I feel like? I feel like watching the boxing. Watching? At least. Yeah, yeah, I know. I can't watch. But that's what I've got you for, isn't it? You're supposed to be my eyes. Well, we'll combine a little business with pleasure tonight. Okay. I want to see the big fight at the garden. So we'll go along. And you'll see how good you are at explaining to me exactly what's going on. <laughs> I want a blow-by-blow -blow description of the fight. And heaven help you if I miss a blow. Goodyear presents The Sounds of Darkness. Good evening. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, makers of passenger, truck and tractor tires for every requirement in South Africa's farming, commerce and industry, bring you Lee Masters, the blind detective who challenges the sounds of darkness. Tonight's Sounds of Darkness, you will hear Tony Jay as Lee Masters, James White as Johnny Bridges. Others in the cast are Louis Eif, Adrian Steed, George Carellin, and Hugh Rouse. Now let's join the world of Lee Masters in tonight's Sounds of Darkness, The Last Round. Sailor Pavosky is coming down the ring now, Lee. He's uh, prancing around the ring, holding his hands over his head. <laughs> They've made him favorite. He's six to four on the sailor. Uh, you fancy him? Yeah. Well, me, I reckon Tiger Jackson will stop him inside six. Oh, you got to be joking, Lee. No, no, no. Tiger Jackson's well over 30. This guy's young in his prime. Yeah, I know, I know. Sometimes, you know, a couple of dozen fights under your belt stands you in better stead than five years the right side of 30. Uh, this sailor guy now, he's uh, he's had nine pro fights, that's all. Ah, uh, yeah, I know, Oh, I but... know, I know, he's won them all. Six of them are knockouts. 
but I still like the Titan. Oh, here he comes now. Not such a reception as the sailor, huh? He seems kind of... I don't know. Kind of what? Well, he's not looking around and smiling the way the other guy was. He's walking kind of slow. His head's down. You know, sort of looking at his feet. He's getting into the ring now. He's not playing to the crowd at all, this guy. He's going straight to his corner. He's sitting down. He doesn't look much to me. What's, uh, what's Sailor Powalski doing? He's standing in his corner, hands along the ropes behind him. He's sort of leering at Tiger Jackson. His Polak sure looks confident. Well, when you get a fighting pole, he's usually pretty cocksure. You say Jackson doesn't look so good. I've certainly seen better. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, a ten-round contest at the world of weight limit of 147 pounds. On my right, at 140 pounds, Tiger Jackson! <laughs> At 146 pounds, Sailor Polowski. Well, they're certainly with the pole, all right. He's got them both in the center of the ring now. I give him the old routine about breaking clean and so on. Quiet a minute, Johnny. Huh? I want to listen to that riff. Oh, now, don't tell me you can... Quiet. Okay, so the horse didn't win. Well, can I help it if the horse I back Rob home by 20 lengths? <laughs> Since when's the crying to back a winner? Since you fixed it so the favorite would lose and doped your horse to make sure it won. That's when. You're going to have to prove that cover. Me, I ain't say nothing until I see my lawyer. All right, you bums. Shake hands now. When the bell goes, come out fighting. That ref, Johnny. Who is he? What's his name? Look in the program. Oh, now, don't tell me you could hear anything he was saying over the racket going on. I heard. I can't remember the name, but I, I've heard that voice before at the wrong end of an interrogation session. It says here his name is Lucas. Snowy Lucas. In a pig's eye, his name is Lucas. I remember now. Yeah, his name is Bolt. Piggy Bolt, they used to call him on account. That's just what he looked like. A pig. You know, this, this guy looked at me. Yeah, now you come to mention it, he does. Johnny, my little warning bell is ringing like crazy. you got to keep your eyes peeled. Might be a false alarm, but... I have a feeling that something crooked is on the program for tonight. They didn't seem to do any harm. Then all of a sudden, the guy drops like he's being polaxed. Hey, how about that? The polack was polaxed. <laughs> and they're out, ladies and gentlemen. The winner by a knockout in the first minute, the fifth round, Tiger Jackson. What is it, Johnny? What's the matter? Pavelski isn't moving. He's just lying there. They're trying to bring him around. Not a chance. Mm. Hey, that guy really is out. How do you figure that? A little tap and he's still unconscious. If he is unconscious. You don't mean he's... I don't know. 
but with Piggy Bolt around, it's only natural that things should smell. Come on, let's get moving. I want to be in the dressing room when they carry that guy in. doing here? FBI. Put the guy down. Over here, Snowy. How is he? My boy is hurt bad. I'm Sailor's manager. He's hurt bad. I don't feel any pulse here. He's not breathing. Yeah. Somebody's got quite a lot to answer for. This was Pawalski's last round. He's dead? Are you trying to say my boy is dead? He's dead. And just to make the party complete, his breath smells of bitter almonds. Potassium cyanide to you. Okay, you better sit over there. Yeah, what is all this anyway? To my way of thinking, the murderer must be one of you guys. Yeah, Where are you getting that, copper? You're first, Tiger. Oh, me? I don't know nothing. I mean, uh, for why should I want to murder the bum? I had him beat anyway. Sounded like a great fight tonight, Tiger. Uh, thanks, copper, but I don't know nothing about it, honest. You're next, Collie. Uh, this is a lot of nonsense. Why would I want to harm my own boy? Why should I Name go to... first. Who are you? Collie Blake. I'm the sailor's manager. I was in his corner tonight, like I am every night. You was talking about Patar, whatever the name was. Well, I don't know nothing about that. Everything went like it usually does. I don't see how anybody could have slipped the guy a Mickey. Well, we'll see about that. Tell me, Collie, the water bottle. Yeah? Did Sailor drink between rounds? A fighter don't drink between rounds, very, very rarely. He takes a swig from the bottle and he spits it out. He maybe gargles a bit. But not very often does a fighter drink between rounds. Well, that way he'd get sluggish, you know? Yeah, I see. You got that water bottle, Johnny? I got both of them here, one from each corner. And I got the buckets they used to sponge them down. Good. All right, next. Well, I'm Snowy Lucas. Uh, I was rough for the fight. I, I can't tell you nothing. Ah, uh, yeah. Mr. Lucas. That's right. Would it have been at all possible, in any way, for anything to have been introduced into Sailor's mouth from Tiger's glove? Hmm? Uh, come again? You, you mean, could the guy, uh, Tiger, could, could he have had this poison on his glove and pushed it in the Sailor's mouth? That's what I mean. Hey, now, listen, I didn't do nothing. I'm not asking you, Tiger. Well, Mr. Lucas, would it have been possible? No, no, not a chance. You see, when they go down under the canvas, when their gloves touch the deck, before they start fighting again, it's the ref's job to grab the guy by the wrist and rub the gloves on his shirt, the, the ref's own shirt. Well, that way you get rid of the rosin, you know. They, they put the rosin on the canvas so the guy won't slip. Well, a dirty fighter will try to keep this on his glove. So that at the first opportunity, he can rub his glove in the other guy's eyes and temporarily blind him. Yeah, that I know. Yeah, yeah well, like I said, tonight's fight was clean. There was nothing like that. Uh, when Tiger did go down, I made sure he wiped his gloves clean. Yeah, I see. Well, there's just one thing that worries me, Mr. Lucas. Yeah, what's that? The fact that your name isn't Snowy Lucas. Huh? It's Piggy Bolt. And the last time you and I talked, you were dodging a rap for doping a racehorse. Yeah, you won a lot of dough that time. You know, wait a minute. Maybe I... you also won a lot of money tonight. Maybe you backed Tiger Jackson to win. And maybe you made sure he did win by poisoning Sailor Pawalski. Maybe somehow, when you wiped the rosin off Tiger's gloves, you 
managed to rub some poison on him. Him must be nuts. Maybe. Maybe not. But it's a possibility, isn't it, Piggy? It's a possibility that could send you right to the chair. You're listening to The Last Round. Tonight's Sounds of Darkness, brought to you by Goodyear, the greatest name in rubber. Lab report on the gloves, Lee. Yeah. What do they say? No trace of cyanide, not a thing. you was nuts. So you did, Piggy. Well, it looks like it maybe lets you out for the time being. Say, how long have we got to stay here? Till I find the murderer. Yeah, but it's one o'clock in the morning already. Oh, yeah, that's right. It is. All right, who's next? My name's Wilkie, Jess Wilkie. I manage the tiger here. And you were in his corner tonight? Sure, I'm his second, too. Uh, what do you know about this? Honest, Mr. Masters, I don't know nothing. My boy was doing good tonight, and he would have won anyway. I had nothing against this, sir. I mean, why should I? My boy was the better boy, and he was all set to win. So why should I follow it all up by giving them poison? Anyway, I, I, I was never anywhere near him. So the lab reports show no traces of cyanide in either of the water bottles, or the buckets, or on the sponges, or the gloves. That right, Johnny? That's right. So how in the heck can somebody give a fighter in the middle of the ring, in Madison Square Garden, in the middle of the fifth round, a fatal dose of poison? Can I talk to you a moment, Lee? Well, I wouldn't leave this bunch alone with the body. All right, I tell you what. You got a guard outside? Sure, I got four fellows from the central precinct. Okay. Let them escort this bunch of beauties into the dressing room next door yeah, and keep an eye on them. Over, over. They're not to talk to anybody. And while they're at it, they may as well search them. Yeah, you can't search us unless you got a search warrant. Well, now, you're quite right there, yeah, Piggy. I know I am. But I tell you what the position is. Either you let us search you here and now without a warrant. Huh? In other words, you cooperate with the police for a change. Or else I'll personally see that they tie a charge on you for resisting an officer in the execution of his duty, and you'll do six months before we even start. Well, hang on, wait a minute. And I'll search you anyway, by force if necessary. Huh? So, what do you got to say to that? Well, well look, I, I'm not beefing. I, well, sure, you can search me. I got nothing to hide. That's mighty nice of you, Piggy. I'll say this. Open the door, Johnny. Okay, Lee. Officer, take this uh, chorus line round into the dressing room next door and keep an eye on them till I let you know. Sure thing, Mr. Masters. Come on, you guys. This way. Yeah, well, all right. Well, Johnny, what is it? I was thinking. Seems like the only way anybody could have poisoned that guy would have been to have given him the poison in the ring. That, Johnny, is the problem. I know it sounds impossible, but that's just what must have happened. But, Lee, I'm telling you, it didn't happen. Look, think back. Think hard. In between rounds, between the... How was it? The fourth and the fifth rounds. Yeah. Anything happened? Anything at all? Chief well, Lee, I don't think so. I mean, you know, the usual stuff. You know, like rubbing the guy's muscles, fanning him with a towel, giving him the water bottle, all that kind of jazz. Nothing special. You sure? If there had been anything, I'd have noticed. That I'm sure of. Uh, which leaves us right back where we started. Somebody poisoned that guy while he was in the middle of the ring, watched by 6,000 people. Well, 
What did you get, Johnny? Uh, Lucas or Bolt or whatever his name is was telling the truth. He backed to Gran on Tiger Jackson to win. Nobody else had a bet. But I ran into Droopy outside. Oh, is that who's with you? Yeah. Yeah, that's me, Mr. Lee. Well, you might be just the guy I want to talk to. Guess there's not much goes on in the sporting world, either on the level or crooked, that you don't know about, is there? Well, I keep my head to the ground. Now, what's the word on the killing? Killing? Somebody dead? Maybe. How was the money going? What was the betting like on the fight tonight? I mean, uh, last night. Ah, uh, you mean Sailor Pawalski and Tiger Jackson? Yeah, there was big bread floating around on that one. A lot of dough, huh? Uh, you asked me, the syndicate climbed in on this one. As big as that, huh? Yeah. And these guys don't open their eyes under a hundred grand. Uh, the way I heard it, they stood to win half a million bucks. And they won, of course. Of course. When the syndicate bets, that ain't a gamble. That's a certainty. One way or another, they make sure of that. Yeah. Okay, Droopy. Thanks a lot. See you around. Uh, here's something for your trouble. Oh, gee, thanks, mister. It wasn't no trouble. For you, Mr. Lee, it's only a pleasure. You know that. Sure, sure. Have a drink anyway. Yeah, okay, Mr. Lee. I'll see you around. Well, very interesting, Johnny. Yeah. As I remember the fight the way you told it, Sailor didn't look as if he was losing until he dropped in the fifth. Is that right? That's right. And in spite of the fact that I fancied Tiger... Sailor was the obvious one to win, wasn't he? He started out as unfavorite. Yeah, that's right. You know what I think? What's that? I think the sailor was going to take a dive. Hmm? I think it was all arranged that way. And for some reason, he changed his mind. By this time, it was too late. Uh, the syndicate had already laid out close to a quarter million bucks. He had to lose. That's why he was killed. So now we know why. But we don't know how or who. Uh, just let me think a minute, Johnny. When you've eliminated every alternative, what you're left with must be the modus operandi. Huh? Yeah. Now, so far, we've eliminated the fact that he might have been given poison before he came into the ring. Uh -huh. He didn't pick up poison from Tiger Jackson's gloves. All right. He didn't get poison from the water bottle. True. And there were no traces of cyanide in the buckets. We've searched every one of these birds, and every one of them is clean. Of course. Why didn't I think of that before? Why? I must be slipping. If I had seen the fight tonight instead of you telling me about it, I'd have solved this thing before we got up from our seats. What are you talking about, Johnny? You know something? I think I know how this thing was done, and I think I know who did it. Trouble is, I... I haven't got the faintest idea how I'm going to prove it. Okay, okay, gentlemen. I've called you all back in here to tell you that in any moment from now, you can all go home. Oh, it's the nicest thing you've ever... All of you, all of you, except one, that is. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'll tell you why Sailor Powalski was murdered. And this isn't guessing. We've checked, and we know. About two weeks ago... The syndicate approached Sailor through a third party and offered 20 grand for him to take a dive. Sailor agreed. The third party clinched the deal and took the 20 grand. When he went to give Sailor his share, the pole had changed his mind. No amount of persuasion on the part of this third party could get the Sailor to throw the fight. Now, our friend, Mr. Third Party, was in trouble. The syndicate had laid out big, big money. Sailor had to lose. On his form, he was a cert to win. So, Mr. Third Party, the murderer, hit upon a bright little scheme. He got hold of some prussic acid. Yeah, and I know where he got it from. 
the poison was put into a soluble capsule, long and thin. And then the capsule was put into the sailor's mouth. What are you talking about, copper? Your brother-in-law develops photographs, Collie. Bet there's plenty of potassium cyanide lying around his darkroom. Yeah. You put the capsule in the sailor's mouth, didn't you? You're nuts. When did I get that chance? Before round five started. In the ring, in full view of 6,000 people, you slipped the capsule in his mouth. Oh, the gum shield. Of course, the gum shield. That's huh? right. That's right, Piggy. Who handles a fighter's gum shield? Only his second. Prove it. I'd like to see you prove it. Just before the fifth round started, you slipped Sailor's gum shield back into his mouth. Only this time, the cyanide capsule was stuck to it. You knew, you knew with a couple of punches to the mouth that the capsule would burst and that the sailor would swallow the poison. And that's the way it happened. Da, talk, just talk. Prove it, copper. I have proved it. That gum shield went to the laboratory. They found the traces that I need. Why, you... <coughs> Get him, Johnny. <coughs> All right. All right, I did it. What could I do? It was him or me. You know the syndicate. If Sailor had won, they'd have rubbed me out for sure. I didn't have no chance. Thanks, Collie. I got three independent witnesses to your confession apart from the police. Take him away. Okay, come on, Collie. Come on now. Come on. Okay. Well, maybe I'm not such a bad gambler after all. A gambler? What are you talking about? I didn't have that gum shield tested. What? It wouldn't have done any good. In the first place, all traces of cyanide would have been washed off it by the saliva in the mouth. And in the second place, it wouldn't have proved anything in the first place. You were bluffing? Yeah, I bluffed him into squealing in front of witnesses. He'll make a full confession down to the central precinct. That's the only way we could have got him, Johnny. Next time I suggest a night off watching the fights, uh, just sock me one, will you? Tonight's Sounds of Darkness, presented for your entertainment by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, makers of world-famous passenger tires, truck and tractor tires for every requirement in South Africa's farming, commerce and industry. Join us next Friday and every Friday night at 9.30 when Goodyear will again present the blind detective Lee Masters in... The Sounds of Darkness. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. You can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio